Good morning, MTA board, and good morning, MTA public. May I call to order the March MTA board meeting? Thank you all for being here. Um, General Counsel Paige Graves, can you update us on the quorum? Yes, Chair Lieber, we have a quorum. Attending remotely is board member John Samuelson. Welcome, John. Thank you, Paige. Uh, bef uh, before we uh, hear from the public speakers, we're going to have the customary safety announcement. Let her rip. Your safety is of foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen to the following instructions. In the event of an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and 911 should be called. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell D down the hallway past the elevators. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. Thank you and have a safe day. Thank you, recorded safety announcement. Um, can we hear from our public speakers, Lucille? Good morning. We have 18 members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Jason Anthony, followed by Lisa Daglian. Good morning, MTA board, and good morning, John Samuelson. Why are you not here? Jason Anthony from hey, ALU. Jason Anthony from ALU. While my co-workers are voting on our first worker-led union election, I'm here representing them. This early morning, around 3 a.m., while I was on my way home, I was on a Brooklyn-bound two train witnessing a person smoking on the train. This is not the first time I see this. Who it came to mind? Our brother, Gary Goebel, who passed away tragically. And who came into mind? Brothers and sisters, like my brother Turmel, who has to drive a train, operate a train, like me in that train, I was kind of scared going to my house in downtown Brooklyn at three in the morning. What'll be like going to my work in the Bluefield section of Staten Island at that time in the morning. We need more police presence inside our trains to protect our brothers and sisters who work in transit, my, call, my fellow passengers as well. It is time to protect us who work and ride the trains. I'll see you guys next month. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Daglian, followed by Rachel Faust. Hi, good morning. I'm Lisa Daglian. I'm the Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, or PCAC. With today's board meeting being held so close to the start of the state's new fiscal year, the FY23 budget is top of mind particularly in light of some of the potentially dire funding news we heard on Monday. With the MTA's revenue tied so closely to ridership and fewer people getting back on board than the McKinsey forecast, it's clearly time to ramp up the conversation about finding additional dedicated source of operating revenue. It won't be an easy issue to resolve, and we look forward to adding incoming 
transit president Rich Davies' voice to the chorus as we work with all our partners to, on solutions. But an, an immediate no-brainer would be seem to hold the immediate, an immediate no-brainer would be to hold harmless the gas tax. That's a conversation I can't wait. There are voices calling for a gas tax holiday, but that's no holiday for transit or roads or bridges for that fact. And while people who drive would get a break, even as they tend to be wealthier than transit users and add to congestion and pollution, riders would get no relief. In fact, in the long run, riders on the LARR, Metro North, Staten Island Railway, and our subways and buses could permanently lose the critical funds the gas tax provide if some in Albany have their way. The problem is that once the horse is out of the gate, the stampede starts. If giving drivers a break is so important, then New York should be more like California than Connecticut. We do like the fact that as gas prices go up, so does ridership, another case for not reducing taxes. However, if there is indeed money to make it, it makes more sense, if there is indeed money available to hold the MTA harmless if, if this so-called holiday is enacted, it makes more sense to us to give those available funds to the MTA on a regular basis as part of a new lockbox dedicated operating revenue rainy day fund. Because the fiscal tsunami that Pat Foy warned of may not have struck us this time, thanks to Senator Schumer. Please it, conclude your remarks. It looms large in the distance if we don't prepare for it now. Thank you. And Naomi Rennick. Our next speaker is Rachel Foss, followed by Christine Serginian Yearwood. Good morning. My name is Rachel Foss. I'm the Senior Research Analyst for reInvent Albany. We advocate for more transparent and accountable New York government, including for authorities like the MTA. First, I would like to highlight our opposition to a state gas tax holiday. We and 15 other organizations, including Community Service Society, Riders Alliance, and PCAC, as you just heard, released a statement calling on the governor and legislature to not include this proposal in the state budget. It does little to help those New Yorkers by hurt by rising prices, takes revenue away from needed road and transit investments, and completely contradicts the state's climate goals. MTA CEO and Chair Jana Lieber said that it would be damaging to the MTA's bond rating. Further, this would set a terrible precedent for the MTA's dedicated taxes, particularly as it seeks new state dedicated revenues as federal funding runs out. Second, as I wrote in an op-ed for Gotham Gazette earlier this month, we have high hopes for implementation of the new MTA Open Data Law, signed by Governor Kathy Hochul in October, and sponsored by Senator Comrie and Assemblymember Carroll. Next month, April 2022, the MTA must publish a catalog of its public data sets and schedule for releasing this information in the next three years. As the MTA develops the catalog, we encourage staff to look at three important opportunities highlighted in my op-ed. First is ridership projection. The MTA currently posts daily ridership on its web website compared to 2019, though I note that Long Island Railroad and Metro North data should be updated. We are pleased this data is now on the state open data portal. However, ridership projections from McKinsey are not currently released as open data. As part of the MTA's new contract for updated ridership projections, this data should also be released as open data. Second and third, we think the MTA should look at the congestion, congestion pricing environmental assessment data because open data on congestion pricing will help advocates help the MTA and help make the case for why we need congestion pricing. And lastly, as I mentioned, we'd like to see open data on the 20-year needs assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Serginian Yearwood, yeah, can followed you by. Can you find Maggie and ask her to come to my office? I want to brief Kavesh by phone on the platforms. He just texted me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call him. Um, you're you need to mute, mute my brother. All right, <laughs> keep going, Lucille. Our next speaker is Christine Serginian Yearwood, followed by Kara Girl. Hi, good morning. Um, this is Christine. I'm the founder of Upstand. And you have probably heard me speak about issues of safety and access over the past seven years, particularly for pregnant people, parents, and caregivers. Um, I also have three young children of my own, and I've been using a stroller to get around the city for eight years now. And eight years is not an insignificant amount of time. I think people think of stroller users as using them for like one to two years as a phase, but it's almost a decade of my life. And 
I recognize that this will end for me at some point, but there will always be children using strollers in this city. And you've heard from many others on this issue lately, and I'm grateful that they have shared and that you have listened. Um, in my role with ACTA, and also just in general as an advocate, I also work with lots of disability advocates. And I completely recognize that using a stroller as a mobility device is um, different in many ways. And I'm also grateful to have had their input um, to advance on this issue. I think we definitely do need to work together. It's really clear that nobody wants this to be a zero sum game. So I, I want to say that I fully support the working group idea. My, my main concern is that change actually needs to happen. A lot of short and long term solutions have been proposed over the last few weeks and months. Um, and I just want to voice that we really need action and steps to actually come out of this group and from you um, and from you as leaders to move some of these solutions forward. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kara Girl, followed by Jose Hernandez. Good morning. I'm Kara Girl, Research and Communications Associate at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. Queens is the world's borough, and it deserves a bus network that adequately serves its many diverse communities. The new draft Queens Bus Network Redesign Plan will do just that, and Queens riders have much to be optimistic about. Thank you for going back to the drawing board after taking into account the concerns and feedback of riders from the previous plan. The new plan will help make buses faster, more reliable, and more frequent with reduced headways. We were thrilled to hear that the new plan does not depend on being revenue neutral, which is a big win for Queens riders who will not have to sacrifice quality for cost. As DOT Commissioner Rodriguez said, buses are an opportunity to have an above ground train system. And as Jano has said, buses are the engine of equity around the region. With this plan that revamps over 100 routes serving over 800,000 riders, we hope that this becomes a reality. We're also glad to hear that you will continue a robust public input process with 14 public workshops, and we encourage all Queens riders to make their voices heard. As public input is taken into consideration, we hope that connectivity to the subway, Long Island Railroad stations, and the future Interborough Express will be prioritized. A more connected and integrated transit system will be good for both riders and the MTA. We heard about first and last mile options to the commuter rails at Monday's joint committee meeting and hope that buses can fill some of those gaps to stations within the city. Additionally, better bus connections to LaGuardia Airport should be prioritized regardless of the configuration of the Port Authority's plans. We urge you to encourage your colleagues at the Port Authority to increase transit access to LaGuardia through an MTA operated service, including rail options. This will help bring more riders on board and keep their fares within the MTA system. We appreciate the MTA's commitment to prioritizing the needs of Queens riders who depend on the bus network every day and look forward to seeing the plan in action. We're confident that a better and more equitable Queens bus network is well on its way. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose Hernandez, followed by Alita Tapri. Can you hear me now? I'm here to voice my opposition to the MTA allowing passengers who board a bus with a stroller from utilizing the wheelchair locations. Individuals with disabilities already have a hard enough time riding buses, whether it be drivers refusing to pick us up, passengers refusing to give up the wheelchair locations, or drivers not enforcing the ADA regulations. Even after we boarded the bus, we have to deal with indirect insults from passengers who have had to move. Instead of the MTA improving access to buses by updating language or educating the general public about the wheelchair locations, they were going to add another obstacle for us to have to contend with. If the disability community did not intervene, the MTA would have continued with a pilot program to allow parents with strollers to utilize the wheelchair locations without our input. This would have never happened under the leadership of Andy Byford, former president, and Alex Elgu, and former senior advisor to system-wide accessibility. They would have reached out to the um, disabled community to hear our concerns and get our input. They really understood the sentiment, nothing about us without us. This, uh, the current leadership at MTA does not have the same sentiment. On the contrary, interim president Craig Cipriano was overheard saying, give the disability community nothing and they will love you for it. The current 
Chief Accessibility Officer, Kamal Arroyo, knew that this was spoken about last at last board, um, month's board meeting, and they could have easily reached out to the disability community, and he did not. Um, and he has in the past when it was convenient for him and um, the MTA. I'm glad to hear that the MTA has uh, decided to dive deeper into the topic of strollers on buses and create a task force that includes voices from the disabled community. However, I need to point out this was not the MTA's idea. This was the advocate's idea. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alita Dupree, followed by Jean Ryan. Um, hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you again, uh, Chair General Lieber and members. Alita Dupree, for the record, my pronouns are she and her. It's always good to be back. Uh, never have enough Grand Central Terminal. Uh, you know, I got a good email forwarded by someone in my network. I was able to send you information about my reduced fare metro card uh, so I could get more information about Omni uh, with that. So I hope we can enable uh, reduced fare uh, with Omni soon. So thank you. And I've been scratching my head lately. It has come to my understanding that we are starting diesel engines on the Park Avenue viaduct uh, when we are still in this underrunning third rail territory. We can notice it in the right side of my picture. We have to ask why, why we're not taking advantage of the electricity that we have available. And hopefully more of that electricity can be uh, renewable. And uh, as we go forward in, with Omni, I was in a drugstore lately. They have these debit cards for sale. What does that mean? It means anybody can, banked or not, can go and purchase debit cards and participate fully in the electronic banking system. I don't think it gets much more inclusive than that. So we, we, we want to work on that. Uh, we shouldn't have uh, the money floating around on the system shouldn't have um, people carrying cash arounds on trains. And we shouldn't have money in the boots. It, it invites trouble. And nobody should get hurt. Nobody signed up for that. Um, and uh, what will Omni look at, like on railroads? I hope we can get schematics for that. Uh, I'm having trouble imagining how you do it on 67 tracks in Grand Central Terminal. But I say it again, I hope to be back on the system soon to be reminded again of the words of Jerry Rafferty, a system that is legendary and stately. And I thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Ryan, followed by Jessica De La Rosa. Hello, I'm Jean Ryan, president of Disabled in Action of Metropolitan New York, DIA for short. I am a mother of two adult children and a grandmother of three and I use a wheelchair. When my children were babies, I was not disabled. And when we went on the bus, I used a baby carrier or had a folded up umbrella stroller. As a wheelchair user, I have been refused entry to buses and I have been met with negative comments from drivers or indifference or driving off, telling me to wait for the next bus or a refusal to make people move or to secure my chair. I have encountered passengers who sighed loudly or refused to move. Most drivers and passengers are cooperative, but not all. Other cities say in their policies that caregivers do have to fold their strollers and hold their children if the bus becomes crowded or if a wheelchair user needs the space. They are not allowed to block the aisle. I am concerned about exactly how would this be implemented when the bus becomes crowded? Will the caregiver be able to fold up the stroller and carry the child? Will the aisle be blocked? What happens if someone with a big stroller insists on coming on? Will the driver have to be the stroller police? When wheelchair users need this wheelchair space, how will that be handled? Enforcement could be a problem. Also, how to manage the aisle when three or four walker users and shopping carts are in front. I suggest removing two forward facing seats further back for a space for two open small strollers and two caregivers. A three or six month trial could be conducted on one bus line. I am looking forward to having the working group as well as having the subway elevator case settled 
so subways will be more accessible for all users. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica De La Rosa, followed by Jennifer Bartlett. I'm here today, can you hear me? I'm here today to speak about the strollers utilizing the wheelchair securement area. Monday, someone testified and mentioned that it feels like buses say you're not welcome. Well, welcome to my world. Less than a quarter of the subways are minimally accessible to me and still waiting 30 years later for more. That's definitely saying disabled pe to disabled people, you're not welcome and now this. When I think about my disabled brothers and sisters who laid on the ground in front of buses to fight for equal access, I get this overwhelming sense of pride. My people did that. Those securement locations are ours by law. Microaggression is very real. Hearing comments like, don't they have accessoride or oh my God, not another one is exhausting. I am continuously humiliated by drivers and passengers when riding the bus. Let's not even add into account rush hour when buses are full. We are the ones waiting in the hot, the cold, the rain because it's too crowded. I would love to see any of you try to park a wheelchair with a stroller, people, shopping carts, and bags in the way, and don't even think about stubbing a toe. The MTA continuously makes decisions about services that will affect individuals with disabilities, how they use mass transit without our input. There is no excuse as to why we are not included in the discussion. Our input is important, and thanks to a group of us, the MTA is creating a committee on how to move forward. Without that group, this pilot would have gone ahead. And what does that say? At the end of the day, mothers can still board a bus, whether they fold up a stroller or have a location for it in the back of the bus. If those two wheelchair securement locations are occupied, then we cannot get on. I am tired as a person with a disability, continuously fighting for scraps and being told that I should be full. This brings me to you, Craig. The amount of time you and I have been somewhere together and you look me in my face, allowing me and the disability community to be fooled that you have our best interests at heart. I'm right here, shame on you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Bartlett, followed by Christopher Greif. on it's it on okay first I want to thank Sarah and Joe for the wonderful advertising they've had the um, customer service announcements the digital ones they're very beautiful and thank you I'm gonna do something unusual I'm going to ask for an answer. I have two specific asks. On the Brooklyn Bound B42 at 23rd Street and Davis in Long Island City, Queens, the DOT has put a loading zone and a bus stop in Vernon Joe's People have been fighting this for five months. It is dangerous. It is a marked bus stop and loading zone in the same location. Will you change it? Jenna, will you change it? Uh, the format, we don't usually respond, but we will look into it. I just don't know anything about it, and we're, we're going to ab absolutely look into it right away. Thank you, sir. It's so dangerous, and I've been telling people on Twitter for months. The second thing, I'd like some transparency on why you need to close the seven... To, um, Meds to seven platform uh, at Grand Central for a month. What? Well, I don't know. It's a new elevator. Why does it need to be closed for a month? Thank you for your My comment. My email is r e j e n n i f e r gmail dot com. Please send me in. Please conclude your remarks. I, I know how the system works. I know 
it Easy may to need a month, but you need to yeah, tell the to public why. Please conclude Thank your you. remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker Thanks is Christopher Greif, followed by Karen Argenti. Good morning. I'm Christopher D. Greif. As a person with a disability that doesn't been shown, I do. I definitely agree with my fellow advocates also regarding this issue. But I remind everyone, not all disabilities are shown. A lot of disabilities are hidden. And there are people that are remember that we can agree and disagree. But at the same time, we are fighting the same advocacy for rights for our disability. That means getting on and on and off the buses. And the drivers still need to have that training about showing respect to the customers, even as a senior or a person with a disability. I am also here to speak about the Queen's redesign for the draft plan. If I repeat again, draft plan. I like what I'm seeing, but I need to remind again that buses that connect must connect to an accessibility train station. The train stations are for easy access to get people to where they have to go, easy access and safety. We need to make sure that it's also connecting to other bus line connections, easy and much more proper lighting at those stops because there are a lot of bus stops that do not have proper lighting. Also to remind, and I know Jean Ryan uh, was, uh, is part of uh, with the and I agree what she's saying is all, but we also need to remind that when we have these shuttle buses, we need to have clear access for the R shuttle for curb cuts so people can get on and off. You have a lot of seniors and people with disabilities in Bay Ridge. And we need to remind people with that, that there are other access to other train stations and connecting to other buses that will take you to a train station. So please let's remind ourselves that accessibility reroutes needs to be put in. We as disability advocates have the right to get on any bus, any express bus, as well as a train. Thank you, everyone. Our next speaker is Karen Argenti, followed by Tramel Thompson. Hi, my name is Karen Argenti. I'm with the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality. Um, in 2011, the New York City Planning Commission wrote in a ULARP application which created a park from the end, the, the end of Van Cortlandt Park south to 230th Street. Though not part of this application, the tracks between West 230th Street and 225th Street are owned and still in use by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. The MTA will continue to maintain and use these tracks until at least 2013, after which time DPR is planning to lease the row, the right of way, from the MTA for the purpose of creating another segment of Greenway that will connect to that of the current proposal which if you do this, you would get connected all the way south to the Harlem River and um, beyond. Eventually, the goal is to have a greenway continue along the waterfront of the Harlem River, connecting to other existing and proposed greenways further south. In the spirit of transparency, we asked the MTA to answer why the community can't walk and bike on this land as it leads to a waterfront greenway. Why does Metro North instead have plans to use it for storing freight trains? As you know, this area was always a commuter service and it is adjacent to Marble Hill NYCHA projects, a long time EJ community. Clearly storing freight trains, oh, garbage freight trains, is not exactly a healthy activity, especially since the only freight along that line is a CXX garbage train. We, we, we asked for an environmental impact statement before you, or after, before you even start doing any kind of these procedures. Is my time up? Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tramel Thompson, followed by Alexander Kemp. Chairman Lieber, how are you doing today? I have channel, Chairman Lieber, how are you doing today? I wanna to ask you, what do you consider safe? You know, you, you've been in the media saying that the subways is safe and it's not safe. And I understand your position. You wanna get people back to the subways. We wanna get people back to the subways too. But you can't go in the media and invalidate the concerns of transit workers. You know, you're invalidating the, the concerns of riders. You're saying it's safe and we're seeing something different. You're saying the data is this, we're seeing something different. Um, last month in the news, 
two people were raped or attempted raped, right? Um, the workers who work in that section, they are not debriefed by their supervisors. There should be posters by the supervisors shown to the workers. We have women workers that work down there who can also get harmed, right? Nothing is being done about that. We want to be safe. We want you to give a better message. You could say we're working towards it being where we want it to be, but it's not where we want it to be right now. You're just going out there and say, hey, it's safe. The mayor one day said it's safe, then he said it's not safe. What do you think it happens with, what happens with these conflicting messages? It sends the wrong message. And we look at you as a leader. I look at you as my leader, but I don't want my leader to give the wrong message and invalidate transit workers uh, concerns or complaints or the riders. We have to do better. It's not safe. We have shootings going on. That's not safe. But I have a proposal for you. You're going to be in my neighborhood this Friday at 9 a.m. I want you to leave your security at home. I want you to take the train because you got to take the train to the bus there. I want you to use your company car. That's really your company car, the train and the bus. Use your company car, no security, and feel like how we feel every single day. Would you take me up on that challenge? <laughs> it's easy to do it because I always do, but keep. But keep no, going. I want you to go to Bed Stop, Brooklyn, and do it. Oh, Literally. I know exactly. It's, it's a difference. It's a difference. Oh, Please it's keep. not a difference. My sister lives there, and I go there frequently, so I'm happy to do it, and I look forward to seeing you. I'll meet you there. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexander Kemp, followed by Charlton D'Souza. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Mr. Samuelson, our international president at TW Local 100. Uh, I know you're somewhere, I heard you, but uh, my name is Alexander Kemp. I am a bus operator first. I'm the recording secretary in the Brooklyn Division of Buses. Um, my question, obviously not to be answered today, uh, is more about who matters more. When we consider strollers and how they affect the people who are disabled, I think a lot of the answers are coming from people who don't operate a bus. Um, secondly, and primarily, we can revert back to what's first, is that you guys don't understand the consequence of how people will be ill-affected who use wheelchairs, people who are visually impaired, people who have walkers, people who have service animals. None of these, I don't believe, are being considered. But there's a greater portion about who matters more? Where does the bus operator's safety come into play when he's now being, or she is now being forced to make a decision on who's more valid when there are three people standing in the rain, uh, sitting in the rain, leaning in the rain, waiting for service that has been cut, that has people with disabilities waiting for longer and longer periods of time, to now have a bus operator who's 45 minutes late because you reduce service, because you refuse to add the service back that you have cut years ago, and now force the driver to say, hey, you come on the bus, you stay. And then when he says that, when he gets punched in the face, when he gets spit on, when he gets stabbed, you tell him, come back to work. Don't worry how you're going to get paid. I hope things work out with your landlord. And every consequence falls on you, on the operator. I beg you to reconsider how you are going to affect the future of how transportation works, especially in buses. Please conclude your remarks. With disabled and the safety of bus operators. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlton Tasusa, followed by Chauncey Young. Good morning, everyone. Charlton Tasusa, president of uh, Passengers United, and yet again. We have another crime in the subway. A person was slashed on the head with a machete last night. This is getting out of control. The subways are very dangerous. And, you know, I agree with Tramwell Thompson, um, Mr. Chairman. You know, Mr. Chairman, I respect you. And I know you're trying to do the best you can. But at the same time, the subways are not safe. And it's very dangerous. And, you know, the police officers are not going in the subway cars. And I have an issue with that. Many of the cops are just standing on the sides, playing with their phones, and that's a big issue. So we need help in the subway. Now, with the Queen's Bus redesign, unfortunately, guys, the website 
was crashing last night. Um, every time people were trying to download the Queen's Bus redesign report, it kept crashing. So you'll need to fix the servers. And you guys also need to separate the reports so people can just click on the individual bus line and download what they need from there instead of reading 500 or 600 pages. It would make it much easier for the senior citizens to look at that. And also, I do want to say another thing that, you know, we feel there should be night owl bus service so people don't have to take the subway overnight. Overnight, I have to take three buses from Manhattan to Queens Village. So the Q32 should run every 30 minutes. The Q60 should be extended overnight further into Midtown as part of the Queens bus redesign. And in terms of, you know, what's going on with the ADA community, I feel that everyone, you know, there should be a task force and that the ADA community, everyone should be able to discuss what's going on right now because... There's sometimes you can't see all disabilities. Uh, so that's very important. Again, thank you so much. And I'll see you next month. Our next speaker is Chauncey Young, followed by CN. Good morning. Connecting residents to the Bronx waterfront has been a dream of many Bronx sites, including a former board member of this very organization. Earlier this week, I spoke to former borough president and former MTA board member, Fernando Ferrer, about one of the biggest obstacles to achieving his 1993 Greenway plan, the MTA itself. I have lived and worked in the Highbridge neighborhood of the Bronx since 2004, served as chair of the Highbridge Coalition to reopen New York City's oldest standing bridge, and I'm the coordinator of the Harlem River Working Group, where we are working to develop a greenway and waterfront access for Bronx residents from Randall's Island to Van Cortlandt Park, which not only will provide residents of the South Bronx with access to one of the largest parks in New York City, but will also create a safe greenway link to the newly opened New York State Greenway Trail, Empire State Trail, the largest trail system in the United States, connecting New York City with both Canada, Buffalo, and Niagara Falls. For this dream to become a reality, we not only need to complete the Harlem River Greenway to Fordham Landing, but we need to complete the Putnam Greenway, which after decades of struggle, New York City has agreed to fund, along with the historic daylighting of Tibbetts Brook, the largest daylighting project in the country. Unfortunately, both CXX, Metro North, and MTA have been bad partners in this project, negotiating for years to provide access to the property in the city, while Manhattan, the High Line, was given to the city as a gift by CXX. Just as Tibbet Brooks needs to empty into the Harlem River, the Putnam Greenway needs to connect to the Harlem River Greenway for the city and its residents to see its true value. We have met with the owner of Fordham Landing, Dynamic Star, and considered them a partner as they need and want the Greenway as part of their project. But instead of working with the city to make this project a reality, why has the MTA stopped this project at 230th Street instead of connecting to the Harlem River as originally planned? Can we work to make these connections? We ask that the MTA board meet with members of the working group and New York City electeds to make this decades long dream a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is CN followed by Danielle Avasar. Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about the uh, strollers using the handicapped, um, you know, the wheel wheelchair ramps on the buses. Just remember, we did not choose to be disabled, but you chose to have a baby. That's not our fault. You chose to do it. That's the consequences. So you have to learn that, you know, just stop being lazy. Just fold the damn stroller up and you know, deal with it. And the only reason why certain women want to do this is because they want to sit there with their cell phone and go on social media. They don't want to attend to their baby. They want to dump their baby in the aisle of the bus, which is dangerous, and just abandon their child like that. You know what that tells me? That tells me you're a bad mother. You're a bad mother to want to do that. It's a disgrace. It is an absolute disgrace. And people with disabilities are constantly treated disgustingly. You know, we have problems with access right? We have uh, subway stations are inaccessible. And, uh, you know, and now we're having this with the buses. I mean, when will it stop? I mean, what do you want to do? Institutionalize us or, or, you know, or something like that? Look, we're here and we're here in the city and we enjoy the city and we have every right to have access to transportation. So get over yourself and, you know, just like I said, 
It's not our fault. We did not choose our disability, but again, you chose to get pregnant and have a child. So you know that's, you know, that's your consequence. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Danielle Avasar. Hello, my name is Danielle Avasar. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I, I cannot believe what I just heard right now. Um, uh, I am not part of an advocacy group. I am just a regular citizen and proud parent to be raising a future New Yorker in our city, in a city that I believe should work for everyone. Uh, to be clear, we are asking to be third in line to the disabled and the elderly. We are not presenting a case of us versus them. We should not be pitted each against each other for space either. This is a child safety concern. It's not a laziness concern. Loose children are not safe on moving buses. I have been in bus accidents. They can fly out of your hands. Parents also deserve to ride safely with their children. And it is a system, like I said, that should work for all of us. Strollers should remain open if there are no wheelchairs or elderly needing the area. It's just very simple. And I think the rules need to be established because it seems like we're all getting humiliated by bus drivers. I look forward to the group that's being assembled. I personally like to be a part of it, but we need a change. This cannot drag on or collect dust. And again, it is not an us versus them, but a system that works for all of us. And we deserve it as New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Chair, that concludes the public comment. Thank you to uh, all our public speakers. Um, we we've heard a lot publicly about about subway safety. There's no question. I. I'm not going to respond to the comments that were made, but I'll tell you this. I've spoken out about on behalf of our riders virtually every day in the last few weeks about the need to have a safer system. I've spoken out about that again and again. And what we've been doing is we've been teaming up with the city who has most of the jurisdictional responsibility here to provide homeless services workers, other outreach workers, NYPD, to make sure that we're implementing the governor and the mayor's vision of how do we accomplish a safer system and also at the same time respectfully and compassionately help folks who are using the system for shelter to get into services and to get hopefully a better situation. Um, so we're, we're very much on that. I was out at, at, uh, with Pat Warren and Jeremy Fagelson out at uh, Stillwell, the Stillwell uh, Coney Island complex. Uh, last week at 4 o'clock in the morning, we went to Bay Ridge, the, R, the end of the R train, and saw what was being done. And there were, as I said, all the ingredients were in place. We had, we saw that there were outreach workers, there were social service professionals, the NYPD had, you know, substantial deployments, our own transit workers, who are very much part of this choreography, because they have to clean the trains, and at the moment when there are a lot of times there are folks who are, are sheltering in the system who are, you know, making it hard for them to clean the trains. And we're all working together to try to create a system that can compassionately but effectively um, change the situation. Um, so I, I just want to be very clear with everybody. We are determined to make the system safer. Um, and we're working in partnership with the city government to make it happen. But I have to say is that um, we are seeing results. There are significant results. And you know, as, as much as we are all very concerned, and I think a couple of the speakers mentioned specific incidents which are dramatically concerning and upsetting, but there also are some positive uh, results. Um, I've been asking for a long time for more, more cops to be on the platforms and on the trains, as opposed to on the mezzanines and elsewhere in the system. And Mayor Adams, who's a former transit cop, has been very outspoken and supportive of this. Um, there's been an incident last night that illustrates that we are, this may be having a positive effect. At around 8 p.m., transit police officers patrolling the J train saw a man breaking the rules 
by moving between the cars. We, we, that's prohibited. It wasn't when, when I was a kid, but it is, it's prohibited now because so many people have lost their lives uh, literally falling between the cars. It's a safety uh, rule. But the officers repro reproached that fellow, and he ran. He was apprehended, and they recovered uh, a loaded uh, 22 caliber firearm off of him. That was on the train. There was also, at the mayor and the police commissioner's instigation, a system of bolstering transit patrol, transit bureau uh, police who are in the system all the time, every day, by having patrol officers from precincts come down into the system. And that may also be having some, some results. Early this morning at 82nd Street and Jackson Heights, Officers who were conducting one of those transit inspections, as they call them, observed a man lying face down on the platform. They approached him in the process of doing what the mayor has said, which is that the rules of conduct in the subway system are going to be enforced. And they, they, as I said, they approached him to correct the situation. And he was intoxicated. He rolled over, and lo and behold, a 22 caliber firearm fell out of his jacket. I've had literally, that, those are two instances literally from last night, but there have been other ones where we, because there are cops on the platform now, in many instances, people who are the victims of crime or who have observed somebody with a weapon have been able to report it and get immediate action from the police. So while we are by no means out of the woods and there is a lot of progress that needs to be made on subway safety, I just want to acknowledge that the work has begun, a serious effort is underway, and the partnership that we have with the city, the NYPD, and the social service teams, and City Hall is strong and it's growing, and I just needed to say that at the outset. So to my more pedestrian remarks. Um, before we get started, I want to address again our big news from last week that we've selected a great new transit president. It's Rich Davey. And while he's not officially starting for a few weeks, he is here with us today. Welcome, Rich. Uh, Rich is going to be taking over a really strong operation from Craig uh, Cipriano and Pat Warren. I want to thank them both again for their leadership over the last eight months. especially during the Omicron surge when we were struggling as we have been for uh, you know, some time coming out of COVID with crew shortages. Craig, Demetrius, and the entire team were incredibly creative. And we all know what Pat Warren has been doing, um, not just as, uh, uh, as the chief of safety and security, but standing in, dating back to Sarah's tenure at Transit as the acting COO. So Pat can go back to his small job as being the MTA's chief of safety and security. And Craig, I'm glad, has accepted the position to be the permanent chief operating officer of New York City Transit. Congratulations, Craig. <laughs> Ridership is continuing to recover as we move into spring. More than 3 million people rode the subway every, virtually every weekday this month. It is starting to plateau, which is something we're watching closely, uh, at around 3.2 million on uh, the average sub weekday, um, which is just under our pre-Omicron high. Um, buses are holding steady with roughly a million, 1.3 million daily riders, while Long Island Railroad and Metro North have seen the biggest bump so far. Both railroads are are exceeding their pre-Omicron levels, and we attribute that in large part to um, some of the innovative fare promotions we had, as well as the increases to service that are right underway. Um, agency presidents Craig Cipriano, Kathy Rinaldi, and Danny DiCrescenzo will have uh, more detailed updates for you in a bit. Okay, let's see if we can make this work. Ladies and gentlemen of the technology world, can you advance the slide? Because I cannot. Right you are. Um, <laughs> later, you're going to have a couple of presentations on the major issues um, that have been part of, that we've made part of all the board meetings. That's something that I think the board asked for uh, and that we've made very much part of our regular choreography here. Major issues to talk about at every board meeting. Uh, this month, Deputy CFO Jay Patel 
and Auditor General Michelle Woods will update you on overtime reductions. And Naomi Reddick, uh, our senior advisor for federal policy, will discuss the ongoing efforts to leverage the new federal infrastructure bill and uh, federal money in general. But I want to give you a heads up right now, full disclosure time, that, that this presentation is going to be a bit different than usual, more focused on the big picture and maybe a little boring. Um, normally, this is the slot where I recap current ac recent accomplishments and newsy crises which is certainly relevant to all of our work, but, and there's no, been no shortage of challenges uh, in the six months I've been in the chair. The RCC outage, um, the Hurricane Ida, crew shortages, Omicron, and the subway safety uh, issues we're, we're talking about. But the list goes on and on. Crises are inevitable, but since last fall, there have been a set of coherent priorities that are informing our work, priorities we've been using to shape our management team's goals as part of our reinvigorated performance review system. And I want to take this opportunity to share those with the board. These seven priorities, as I say, came out of the effort to implement a more business-like performance evaluation system. That's the way you run a real business. Um, it, thanks to Lizette Camillo, our new chief administrative officer, we have achieved 80% compliance with performance. People deserve performance evaluation. It's just the basics of running a good business. They need feedback. And especially during Omicron, when there was less face-to-face -face contact, I, need, I think folks need to hear more. How are they doing? What's expected of them? And, and how can we all improve as a team? So thanks to Lizette, we, moved, we basically doubled um, uh, performance evaluation compliance in excess of 80 percent age, agency-wide. But in the process, we found that we needed to communicate a set of goals that would drive the future going performance metrics so everybody would understand at every level what, is, what our expectations are. A lot of this is going to be self-evident to you, but it bears emphasis because we are a big organization, 70,000 strong, and everyone needs to be on the same page. The first three priorities are about getting customers back to transit, while the next four relate to creating a stronger and more effective MTA for the future. None of these are new ideas. You've heard me speak of them many times before. And what I've asked our team to really focus on is the execution of the ideas. I'll walk through each one, and I just want to emphasize at the end of this, there is also a values aspect which we overlay, which will, will include some things we also all care about a lot. Number one, better service. Post-pandemic service needs to make transit the choice for all New Yorkers and how they get around. We want to build on our already strong metrics on time performance. Uh, the subways are just below the target that was set uh, 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 at the outset of the year at 83%. We're also doing well on customer journey time, which is a metric that I look at as really relevant. But there's real room for improvement. Another sub-goal in this broad category is to have fewer cancellations which, and higher service delivery. Clo this is closely related to the crew shortage issue. And our team has shown great resourcefulness and dedication in delivering high levels of service, despite the fact that on any given day, dozens or even hundreds of frontline staff were out sick or out because they had been exposed to COVID. So, you know, hats off to the colleagues, the frontline workers, who were willing to work overtime, in some cases even come out of retirement. And thanks also to Craig and his team's proactive efforts to hire and train more operators and to do it much more quickly than has been done in the past. With these new hires, we built, we've cut the percentage of delays attributable to crew shortages in half or even more. Um, the figure had been as high as 40 to 50 percent of our delays la in the fall, and it's, as I said, under half that right now. We should see even more improvement by the end of the second quarter when staffing goals for subways and buses will be achieved or very close to complete. We're also still looking at ways to safely increase subway speeds, which I singled out as a priority when I started as chair. This is a very technical. Um, a lot of work was done during COVID in making sure the signal timers and the calibrations were up to date. 
um, but there's more that can be done. A lot of it has to do with re-examining the speed restrictions that we have in different parts of the system. If you're, if you can go 30, but you, but it's posted, you know, safely go 30, but it's posted at 25, you're losing an opportunity. Um, we're looking at speeds also on the railroads, and we're also growing service on the railroads. I'm thrilled about that. We're closely monitoring how ridership is coming back. But Metro North, this, uh, this week, just added 66 weekday trains uh, to the east of Hudson Lines. That brings us back to you know, basically to 90 percent of pre-COVID service overall for a ridership that's, that's hovering in the 50s. So there's room, especially in the middle seat, ladies and gentlemen, um, <laughs> but there's, a, there's room on those trains. But we really do want people to feel uh, invited. And part of that is having more express trains and more, uh, you know, just a larger amount of service. Uh, Long Island Railroad is already offering a similarly high level of service and great on-time performance as well. All right. Okay. Number two, uh, safety and respect. We know that the other major factor that's keeping people away from transit is safety. We're proud that our customers continue to comment on the cleanliness of rolling stock and stations thanks to the robust cleaning um, that we have been engaged in since the beginning of COVID. But their main concern now is crime and disorder. Crime in the system is way lower than it was a few years ago, but it's still higher than it was you know, just a few short years ago. And our customers, especially LAPS customers, are letting us know that they don't necessarily feel safe. They've read about high profile attacks on our workers, and I emphasize that we are continuing to push in Albany for more uh, uh, aggressive uh, penalties for people who attack MTA workers. We've done it for the last couple of years, and we're hoping that that comes out of the budget or out of the post-budget session uh, legislation. Um, but customers are seeing people breaking our rules of conduct, evading the fare, smoking, lying down across the entire bench, drinking, and they don't feel comfortable. I've had, you know, Shanifa Riera and Sarah Meyer and I have been up several times to 181st Street, and, and there is a serious problem with, um, there is a, uh, a new uh, safe injection site nearby. We understand that that is something that people are, are doing for, for safety reasons, and there's good policy behind it, but we can't abide a situation where the subway becomes the, the, when that facility closes, the second choice for where to inject, where to use drugs. And we're working with the city to address that one as well. But there are a lot of rules of conduct that we need to deal with. We need our riders to feel welcome. We have strong leaders in Albany and City Hall who are intensely focused on this issue. Both the governor and the mayor have committed substantial resources. I talked about it before. But as the mayor has made clear, we need to increase law enforcement's visibility and to up enforcement. And one of the key elements of the mayor's subway action plan was an effort to find people at the end of the line. I talked about it earlier. And um, there is still room for improvement of that. And much more important, we need to grow it to all of the stations. Right now, it's, at, you know, it's not at the full complement of end-of-line stations. That's what we're working with the city to perfect the choreography, make sure we have the resources, and then to expand it to every line. Number three, we want to increase appeal to our customers. Aside from feeling safe, we want the customers to feel like transit is convenient and their best choice. And there are a number of ways we're tackling this. First is expanding accessibility. Since the outset of the pandemic, we added 14 new ADA stations and got the ball rolling on another 26. We have a long way to go, but this is the, the, we cannot underestimate the significance of a $5 billion commitment in our current capital program to ADA system-wide. We inherited a system that was way, way, way short of true accessibility, and we are attacking the issue every day. We're also moving forward on the fare gates. Thank you, Q, for your leadership on that. And improving paratransit services dramatically. And I welcome Chris um, to the team. We have, a new, we have new leadership at paratransit, and it's already starting to feel the difference. Um, we need, this is a priority because we need mass transit to be appealing to all New Yorkers, 
not just uh, folks who, who are, have access to the system as it is today. Lately, our focus in this category, uh, on this heading, has been providing new fare options better suited to post-COVID commuting. I know that we promised the board a thorough review of the new promotions in June. We'll give you that, but I can't resist giving you some interesting preliminary data today. Fare capping. Already, more than 168,000 people have benefited from the, fare the Omni fare capping system on subways and buses, and that saves them almost a million and a half dollars. Fair capping is also driving even more customers to use Omni. This is important because we want to accelerate the pace at which Omni is adopted. We're not, we're, you know, we're not so far away from the time when we will switch over like we did from the token to the MetroCard, now to the new Omni system. So that we're up to about 30% of total market share for Omni. People do love the conven convenience of tap and go. On the railroads, Thanks to the fair promotion, sales of monthly tickets increased by almost 53% since we introduced that 10% discount. Um, we've also sold more than 33,000 of the new 20 trip ticket, which is um, a great option for people who are commuting uh, less than five days a week. And lastly, we've sold 100,000 weekly city tickets. That's the flat fare ticket for rail travel within New York City. This is something I'm really excited about, that people who, who maybe are, 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 are taking a bus and a subway uh, from some part of Queens uh, or Brooklyn are having their commutes cut in half uh, if they can take a commuter railroad. That's a huge, huge transformative benefit. Um, also in this category, we've also made progress with the city on maximizing the use of fair fares, which is uh, just a huge and important uh, initiative to make the system appealing and, more importantly, affordable for low-income New Yorkers. Transit equity. Number four is to shore up the finances of the MTA. Um, it's especially important as we're looking down the barrel of a $2 billion operating budget deficit, um, which will be unmasked when the federal money runs out in just a couple of years. The $15 billion that the MTA received in three different COVID relief bills, thank you to Senator Schumer and the entire New York delegation. That money uh, is covering the operating deficit now, but as I said, projected to run out in a couple of years. Um, and that projection is going to be updated when we redo the ridership uh, outlook as, as part of uh, the study that's been referred to. We're also aggressively pursuing opportunities for federal capital funding, and you'll hear more about that from Naomi a little bit later. Right now, we're trying to jumpstart discussions in Albany and among state, uh, among budget and state policy wonks about new recurring revenue streams. I want to acknowledge Lisa Daglian's comments from the podium uh, a little while ago, um, which point in that same direction. Uh, I've been bringing this up for a while. With, in hearings with the legislature and hearings with the city council, the MTA's fiscal cliff is real. And we're, as, a, as a society, as a state, as a city, we're going to have to figure out how to make sure the MTA is fully funded, that we can provide service to all of our neighborhoods and all of our New Yorkers um, without putting the cost totally on the backs of the riders. Let's play. Yeah. Okay. Um, even though we're experiencing um, increased support from the state, we're also looking at opportunities to improve our own efficiency, not just reducing overtime, which Jay and uh, Michelle will be talking about a little bit later, but in a wide range of areas to help reduce the height of the fiscal cliff. You know, I, honestly, many of you have been here long enough to know that previous efforts at cost savings didn't achieve meaningful savings, uh, me meaningful enough to close the gap in a significant way. Um, but we're taking another look at how to implement what I call a financial stability program. Uh, this is something that John Kaufman, uh, along with Jay Patel of our 
uh, financial management team is, is starting to get into much more deeply. We all know there are ways that the MTA's cost structure is not competitive with national and international peers and that we need to identify opportunities to trim costs so we can deliver the same or better service more effectively and retain credibility for what will be uh, a, a needed uh, infusion of recurring revenue from our leaders in Albany and elsewhere. Five, strengthening and expanding the transportation network. We've got a ton of work done during the pandemic. There was incredible capital work done. But most of that was from the 2015 to 19 program because we couldn't start new 2020 to 24 projects when we didn't know uh, what was coming from Washington and whether the capital money would need to be cannibalized just to keep the lights on and the system going. But now we are more than a year into the effort to jumpstart the 2020 to 24 capital plan. The good news is that we've already done a lot of work about setting priorities since at the low point of COVID, when funding for the capital plan was, shall we say, up in the air, we had to figure out what was most urgent and what was most safety sensitive. The vast majority was state of good repair work, tracks, signals, switches, pump rooms, power stations, and all the things that customers don't see, but which are critical to safety and reliability. So those projects are at the front of the line right now. Now, sometimes capital, the, the sequence of capital depends on outages and bundling strategies. So you try to get a lot of work done that optimizes the outages, but generally speaking, the state of good repair and the, and the safety sense of work is at the front of the line. But on resilience, another urgent element of our network strengthening agenda, we have done a ton of planning, which is feeding into that board work, staff working group on resilience that has uh, begun its work. On the mega project front, with Eastside Access and Third Track wrapping up, 2022 is shaping up to be the most historic year in Long Island Railroad history. We're also pushing to complete the, the Long Island Railroad concourse at Penn Station by year's end. This photo uh, is from an event a few weeks ago where we removed the last of those dreaded head knocker beams that blocked the concourse for whatever it is, 60, 70 years. And on the Metro North Penn Station Access Project, we awarded the contracts, the board approved them, and the, and the, and the contractor is going to begin work this spring. Finally, we're advancing the environmental review for Interborough Express, the, the project that everyone is so excited about that the governor rolled out in her state of the state message. We're also focused on data-driven long-term planning. You, you, last month, you heard from Frederica Cuenca, who leads planning for the agency about the 20-year needs assessment, and that is moving forward. But with many projects yet to come, we are committed to expanding participation by MWBE firms. We are already our number one among state agencies in dollars paid to certified MWBEs and DBEs, which is the, the federal uh, 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 companion program. Further expanding the pool of contractors we work with is another big step, and I've asked Michael Garner and the DDCR team, and also the folks at C&D who do the procurements and run the projects, to focus on expanding participation. The MTA, in order for the MTA to continue to be the top performer in this category of minority and women-owned business participation, we're going to need more companies. There is, with the Biden infrastructure plan, there's going to be more competition for the expertise and the services of the M's and the W's uh, uh, and the DBEs who are out there. So we really need to grow our pool of partners in that category as well. Number six is the most specific of all the priorities. Others have been, the rest of them apply across agencies and a little, are a little thematic. But buses, I believe, deserve special focus because they are, the, as I always say, the true engines of transit equity in our city. It's time to bring the bus network into the 21st century. First, we need to dramatically increase bus speed. So that means, um, that means more bus lanes, a goal already endorsed by Mayor Adams, uh, 
I uh, made a, we made an arrangement with when I came in and, and the prior uh, administration was still in to dramatically increase the number of bus lanes per annum, but the mayor's goal goes well beyond that and we're excited to work with CDDOT on that goal, but also the use of priority signaling and automated camera enforcement. If you drive, if you drive in the bus lane, if you park in the bus lane, you need to get a ticket. And the good news is that when we issue tickets through the ABLE process, the automatic uh, bus lane enforcement process, only 20% of folks who get a ticket do it again, and only 8% do it a third time. It really works to ticket in the bus lane. And the other thing that I'm going to, I am doing is I am reaching out to the companies, the big truck, the companies who do most of the trucking deliveries in our city, or a large percentage of them, to try to persuade them to disincentivize their drivers about getting bus lane tickets. You know, I'm, I'm not going to name UPS by name, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, or anybody else, uh, but, um, but a lot of the big companies, this is built into their business model. And we need, to, we need their partnership to say, we know you're paying the tickets. What you really need to do is change the number of tickets if you're a good citizen. So we're going to keep working on that. Um, you, you know that we're taking our efforts uh, on buses further and redrawing the service map entirely as part of this borough by borough bus network redesign process. We are so excited about the Queen's uh, draft plan. Um, that was released yesterday. 11,000 customer comments from the prior version, um, which didn't go over so well. Um, but we, the, the benefit was we got all those comments and we were able to use that in taking another crack at it during COVID period. Um, and the new plan checks all the boxes to create more reliable service, faster service, easier service, and importantly, we're better connections to the rail and subway system. We want to make sure the people who live away from, uh, from heavy rail have the chance to, to get a fast ride wherever they're going. Um, riders are going to be able to share their thoughts at 14 public meetings this spring and summer, but there is, there's no time limit on this discussion. We are going to have as many meetings and as many discussions as, we, as needed to make sure we hear from everybody about this. A change can be hard, but we've already had great success with the redesign on Staten Island. Uh, bus speeds there increased by 5% after the, uh, the bus redesign was implemented, and we're keeping a close eye on the Bronx, where the new service plan will be taking effect this June. Um, on the zero emissions bus front, we just issued an RFP to build an electric charging facility in the Bronx, right next to the existing Gun Hill Road bus depot. It's going to support Hundreds of new vehicles were purchasing as part of the capital program. Last year, we ordered 60 fully electric buses, but that pace is going to accelerate dramatically as additional bus production capacity um, develops. Right now, we, no secret, there's a shortage of electric bus uh, production capacity in the United States, but the good news is we have a couple of companies who are already operating in the state of New York. Uh, and we want to make sure that we get a lot of that capacity as funding comes online. And now my fr final priority, which is to reinvigorate the MTA workforce. We're still shaking off the effects of the pandemic hiring freeze. That era left us with many vacancies, and it took a real toll on the employees who stuck around, especially the frontline workers who shouldered the burden through the tough days of COVID. I want to make sure that we're hiring the competence and the muscle that we need and supporting the talented folks at every level of the MTA so that they want to stay and make their careers here. Being more competitive with compensation is something that will help on that front. We have to be honest that we are in a market. We need to offer uh, compensation that's on par with other public sector jobs at a minimum and get to our goal. Believe it or not, our goal for uh, the non-represented workforce is to be in the 20th percentile of compensation relative to the market. We're not even near that right now. And although uh, compensation is frequently controversial, so I just want to be upfront that we have to be able to hire uh, the, the workforce uh, that will make us successful. 
And we have to re continue to prioritize, prioritize diversity in hiring. Um, and my request, uh, Lizette Camillo and the team in Chief Administrative Officer and the, the people group are reinvigorating internship programs. We want to attract you know, people coming out of college and partnerships that allow us to recruit from many different places like the city university system. We are getting into a real discussion with the new chancellor and uh, board chair uh, Bill Thompson about how do we build a real partnership that are going to generate a, a, a continuous flow of different expertise from different city university uh, colleges and universities. We're building a dashboard that's going to more accurately track hirings and separations over time um, so that we can manage staff attrition before it becomes a problem. You have to have, you will have a presentation uh, from Lizette in the months to come, and I just want to tell you, I, I think I reported to you candidly about three, four months ago that the HR side of the transformation was the big problem that we were struggling with. Lizette has really begun to turn this around. The data, just the data alone, is giving us much more command of what we need to do, although bringing ourselves back uh, in terms of numbers and the hiring process is going to take a little while. Um, so now on to values. A handful of core values underlie under all these priorities. And, and even though they do seem obvious, I want to talk about each of them for just a moment to make sure I'm clear about how we work all this through. Accessibility. As I mentioned earlier, accessibility is a major part of our capital program. But it also drives many of our maintenance decisions and our operating priorities. Our bus fleet is technically 100% accessible, but we need to keep training our bus drivers so the experiences that some of the folks uh, described from the podium uh, become less, of a, uh, you know, less frequent. We also need uh, to make sure that bus stop, you know, that that all of the bus stops in the city are accessible, which is not the case. There are a lot of bus stops. Um, which don't have the right curb situation or in, in grassy areas that interfere with mobility. Um, and we've raised this issue with the city. We're also looking at ways to improve uh, transit access for, as I said, for all New Yorkers. We're putting in elevators as fast as we can, but we need to improve the maintenance of our existing elevators and escalators. Uh, so that we have higher availability and that we have fewer outages. And as I say, we're making sure that, that we're getting the most accessibility out of the system that we have now as we improve things. Equity. The region as a whole depends on public transportation, but some New Yorkers are especially reliant on their service, on our services. That's why we give and we will continue to give special focus to improving services in low-income neighborhoods, in communities of color, and in areas historically shortchanged as far as transit and access. That's one reason we're investing so, much, so many resources in the bus network redesign, because I think that is, you know, that is the gold mine in terms of improving uh, equity in a broad way. I know all these priorities have covered a lot of ground. Our challenges are broad and complex. Uh, in coming together with my senior team on these priorities and subsequently ensuring that individual goals of managers down the line are aligned, I feel confident that we're starting to focus appropriately on how to deliver against these goals. I will be tracking progress in regular direct report meetings with our, our different officials, and I look forward to sharing success stories and updates uh, in future uh, meetings. So thank you for indulging me in a long and um, a little less dramatic presentation than usual. And with that, let me turn it over to agency presidents for their reports on ridership and otherwise. Danny, will you start us off? Good morning, thank you. At Bridges and Tunnels, our numbers remain strong with our traffic volumes as we recover from the Omicron surge. Uh, year to date, we're about 4.9% below 2019 pre-pandemic pre numbers. Uh, as January, we were about 12% below pre-pandemic numbers. We made a nice recovery. And month to date for March, we're about 3% below 2019 in the same month. 
Uh, one, of, one of the patterns that we're seeing or trends that we're seeing is uh, normal traffic or, or Monday to Friday traffic uh, increases as the days go on. So we're seeing the heavier traffic on Thursdays and Fridays. There might be a little bit more discretionary travel towards the end of the week. Um, and also, we're seeing that uh, our traditional rush hours uh, come back with about 6 in the morning to 9 in the morning, Monday to Friday, and in the afternoon it's a little bit more elongated with uh, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. as traffic starts to decline about 7 p.m. On, on the weekdays. So we're going to continue to monitor the traffic at Bridgeton and Tunnels, and as the uh, spring comes in and the warmer weather, we start to see traditional traffic increase, and we'll report back to this board. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Any questions for Danny? Kathy, Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Thanks, Jenna. Good morning, everybody. Um, ridership and returning ridership is actually very strong on both railroads. There was a dip for uh, several months because of Omicron, uh, but since that time, both railroads are coming back to ridership levels that we had observed prior to Omicron in early December. So looking first at Long Island, year over year, if you look at Long Island's February total ridership, it actually increased 100.4 percent to nearly 3.2 million riders as compared to February of 2021, where there were 1.6 million riders. Compared to pre-pandemic levels, we're in the low 50s on a fairly routine basis. Uh, in the last several weeks, actually, at both railroads, we've seen fluctuating ridership levels, most recently with a very slight decline last week. Uh, the average weekday ridership last week was uh, about 163,000 riders, which is down about 2% from the week before, but higher compared to two weeks ago and one month ago. Um, just a, a point of clarification, which affects both railroads, um, the ridership formula for the 20-trip ticket has uh, recently been revised to normalize rides over a longer period instead of the date of sale, which is sort of smoothing out the data a little bit with respect to ridership, uh, which reflects the usage of the ticket based upon daily activations as distinct from date of sale. Uh, consequently, totally da total daily ridership numbers from the period beginning February 25th has been restated to reflect the new methodology for estimating 20-trip daily ridership. We've been seeing good numbers, as Jano noted, since the rollout of the new fare structures and discounts, especially with this 20-trip ticket ticket, we knew it would be popular. Um, more than 314,000 rides have been purchased with the new 20-trip ticket since its launch, and we are very confident that this will continue to be the case. So on Metro North, let me just reactivate my iPad here. There we go. Uh, as Jano mentioned, we launched a new schedule this week. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to provide more service, roughly 89% of our pre-COVID service, um, which equates to 14 new trains on the Hudson Line, 18 on the Harlem Line, and 34 on the New Haven Line, uh, along with our pre-COVID weekend uh, service level. So this has been a nice addition for the Metro North customers. With Yankees opening day only the week away, we're happy to be reinstating the Yankee Clipper trains on all three lines, which is a, a nice service for our customers. Customers. Uh, similar to the Long Island, ridership levels have grown steadily since the low point during Omicron in early January. Uh, ridership typically dips a little bit this time of year because of spring vacations. Um, two weeks ago, uh, ridership has slowed a little bit in March. Two weeks ago, it rose nearly 4% from the week before. But again, comparable to the Long Island last week, it dropped just a little bit, about 2% from the week before. And again, we're like the Long Island on Metro North in the low 50s when compared to our pre-COVID baseline. Um, so I think that's about it for this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Question, Mr. Albert? Yeah. Hi, Jano. Uh, thanks for your presentation earlier. You said something when discussing the new fare options that I want to make sure I'm clear on. You said 100,000 weekly city tickets were sold. As there is no weekly, I assume you meant sold within a week? Busted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a it's an individual ride city ticket. You're absolutely right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, onward, uh, Mr. Cipriano. Thank you, General. So, New York City Transit experienced a new surge in ridership in the first week of March as restrictions through the city uh, started to ease. Uh, as General mentioned, I believe it's a result of our strong service delivery. And while we remain optimistic that ridership will continue to increase, we do acknowledge that ridership appears to have plateaued in the recent weeks. Weekday subway ridership now stands at 3.2 million on a two-week rolling basis. And while that's slightly below the fall 2021 peak of 3.3 million, 
When factoring in seasonality, it's considered the same at about 57% of pre-pandemic ridership. Last week was the first week since December when all weekdays exceeded 3 million riders. Patterns of both geography and time of day continue to gradually return to pre-pandemic patterns. Subway travel at 8 to 9 a.m. and 5 to 6 p.m. has risen to 19.4% of all weekday ridership compared to when it was 18.9% in the fall. Travel to and from lower and midtown Manhattan business districts has also increased. In the a.m. peak hour, intra-CBD trips rose the fastest at 15% over the fall. Trips into and out of the CBD rose 6%, and travel within and between the outer boroughs was stable and even dropped just a bit. But those non-CBD markets are still at higher levels than they were pre-COVID. A little bit about buses. Buses continues to recover as we are seeing 1.42 million riders compared to the fall 2021 peak of 1.43 million, which is about 63% of our pre-pandemic ridership. And a look at paratransit shows that on Wednesday, March 16th, we had the highest scheduled volume of trips since the pandemic at just over 25,000 daily trips. The average number of weekday trips scheduled is now at a similar high when compared to the week of November 15th of 2021, when a number of employees and staff had returned to the office in person. Thank you. That, re that concludes the rep transit report. Any questions for Craig? Okay, I was reminded that I should have invited board commentary and questions on my presentation before I went to ride, uh, ridership reports. Any, uh, any uh, cries of disapproval, <laughs> instructions on how to improve the presentation and the visuals? Mr. Zuckerman. I'd actually say the opposite, in fact. I think it's uh, a very well-received report. I didn't, I didn't know you were cooking that up in the, uh, the kitchen there, so uh, I'm glad to see it was like a nice souffle that stayed, stayed up, so thank you for that. Um, I, I, just a couple of brief remarks. One, you're praising the, the business world and having been an advisor in the business world for now 22 years after the Army, I can tell you that it's not always the place to look for uh, brilliance, uh, and in some places, in fact, the not-for-profit sector, government, the military can actually have some very good methods on how to track behavior. I think the old scientific premise that the thing worth thing tracked is uh, the thing that gets better by its very tracking, and I think that's an important attribute you have. Um, I did want to ask you, and certainly I, I would say that I love the voice of cost management. I think uh, we've done, you're right, a few attempts at that, and uh, the error we're in, not just speaking as the finance chair, but just as a business guy, it's, it's going to require it from the whole stack of cost structure, given that more than uh, the majority of our costs are uh, people costs, and that's a tough one to manage, uh, especially the way we have it. Um, I would say you have a comprehensive list. Right? It's, it's, it's the full list. There's nothing I would take off that list. In fact, the challenge sometimes becomes prioritizing such a comprehensive list. I will not put you on the spot and ask you, how are you going to prioritize that? Because that's the job. That's the fun job you've signed up for as both chair and CEO. And we're thrilled to have you doing that. But I, I, I would ask over the coming months and years, however long you're in that chair, how we're going to make those choices because some things that generate uh, better experience for the consumer are actually sometimes often the thing that costs more money. And I do believe choices are always the thing. You can't always have it all. That is not a possible thing, especially under the financial situation that we are and will be under. So again, I say that it's more of a rhetorical point, which is we're going to have to prioritize at some point. And I don't know which ones of the seven, certainly of your four values, I don't know which ones to, to raise higher up or lower down. So just a, a note. Thank you for that list. Good reminder for all of us. Anybody else? Mr. Khaleesi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, Governor Hochul has made a commitment to hire people with disabilities. So when you're thinking about that hiring plan to make sure that you pull off the 55, the state's 55B list, I think was very helpful. Um, looking at the CUNY Coalition of People with Disabilities. I know the work that uh, Lisette Camillo and I did in city government was to increase hiring of people with disabilities, but not just in disability jobs, but also across engineers and lawyers and anything that's there. So please make sure you make a priority to include um, disability in that equity. Appreciate the comment. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Without um, telling you how you should re rearrange your priorities, I thought Neil's point is very correct there. It's, you know, it's how you choose to um, 
but I don't know, I'm going to make it a little more difficult for you and bring up um, one of the things that I found to be absent in several points in there, and, and that's that we're currently not running 100% service. So all the data we accumulate now to compare to a point in time when we did run 100% service is kind of, you know, it's kind of fishy. Um, th though I know you only have certain numbers you can work with as far as your comparisons about when to add service, when not to add, and when to cut service. But it's uh, very important to keep in mind, and I think it deserved a point on your uh, chart as well, that we're not at 100% service, and getting back to 100% service should be a big goal. How else to convince the uh, people in Albany to come up with more dedicated operating money um, when it's lost in the um, ozone, really, that um, we're not running 100% service. So getting back to 100% service as soon as possible will help rebuild the ridership. And as, as much as there is a crime crisis on the system, um, there's also a service crisis on the system as far as reattracting people to the system. Um, if you've got to wait 12 minutes for a train, it's a lot uh, more discouraging than if you have to wait seven minutes for a train or four minutes for a train. And I believe that does affect your demand curves going forward. And I just don't want it to be lost that, um, you know, running a long-term diminished service, while I understand there's, you know, uh, balance, balances you have to strike, certainly on the finance side, um, but the present path um, has us at a lower level. And I don't, you know, and that's what I think needs to be um, addressed. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to hear two. Uh, we're going to hear two presentations now, uh, sort of special issue presentations. Uh, Naomi Rennick. Um, thank you, Jano. So I'm going to go through some of the funding opportunities that are out there and what we're doing to position the MTA to get as much money as possible to support the capital program. Um, first, I want to recap the work that we did on COVID relief. So I think, as everybody knows, traditionally about 50 percent of our operating budget is funded by fares and tolls. So the financial hit from COVID was immediate, and we knew right away in March 2020 uh, that we would need federal assistance. We partnered with transit agencies from around the country with labor, advocacy, business, and other organizations to advocate for emergency relief for transit. With strong support from Senator Schumer, these, res these efforts resulted in three emergency relief bills that included funding for transit, the last enacted just in March of 2021. These bills netted the MTA over $15 billion in operating assistance, which based on our current projections, we expect to balance our budget through 2025. As Jano said, we are updating our projections and we'll keep you posted. Again, this is emergency relief that supports our operating budget. In terms of federal funding for capital, you've heard Jano say that MTA carries 40% of the nation's riders, but receives only 16% of federal transit formula funds. In the early days of the Biden administration, it became clear that the magnitude of the infrastructure bill would create an opportunity for us to try to increase our share since all transit agencies would be getting more money and there'd be a raise all boats scenario. The bipartisan infrastructure law was signed in November of 2021 and it increases the authorization for transit funding by more than 75% compared to the prior authorization. These dollars fall into two general categories. Um, funds we receive based on formulas and so-called discretionary funds that are subject to a nationwide competition. First, the formula funding. The bipartisan infrastructure law creates, um, increases the authorization for formula funds by about 50% over the prior authorization. While the bill was being developed, we partnered up with many of our big city colleagues and successfully advocated to increase the share of formula funds that went into the formula that goes to rail systems. So that was beneficial to us in this authorization. For fiscal year 2022, that's the first year of the new authorization, Congress appropriated the authorized amount of formula funds, an increase of about $600 million for the MTA compared to the prior year. Our delegation definitely understands the formula, that formula funds give us predictability and allow us to plan our capital investments. 
we will be advocating for appropriations to match the authoriz authorized levels throughout the life of the bill. The bipartisan infrastructure law also includes unprecedented funding levels for discretionary grant programs. That's the money that we have to compete for against other systems nationwide. Some of these programs are new, others already exist, but all of them are focused on addressing the administration's goals of tackling climate change, advancing equity, moving people, and creating jobs to spur the post-COVID recovery. A number of discussions are ongoing with regard to funding for some of our larger projects. We have awarded the Penn Access Project, as, um, as I think everybody's aware. Um, Senator Schumer brokered a deal in which Amtrak will contribute to the project, and MTA and Amtrak also were, will pursue 80% federal funding, potentially from the Federal State Partnership Program for the Northeast Corridor. Regulations for this program aren't issued yet, but we've already begun discussing our proposed approach with the Federal Railroad Administration. But a funding decision is unlikely before the fall. Penn Reconstruction, the linchpin of Governor Hochul's commuter first vision for Penn Station in West Midtown, also could be a candidate for this fund source. In January, Governor Hochul directed the MTA to advance work on the Interboro Express. This is a rapid transit project to connect underserved areas of Brooklyn and Queens. This project is not in the current capital program, but we're evaluating whether there's a federal source to support our near-term near planning and design efforts in the environmental review. And we are in discussions with USDOT about our grant agreement for phase two of Second Avenue Subway. We're seeking a total of 3.4 billion, including the 400 million that was in the president's budget that was published this week. So now we're intently focused on, on a strategic exercise to match discretionary fund, fund source, sources in the bipartisan infrastructure law with the prioritized projects that make up our capital program. This exercise involves considering project readiness, cost, and how well the project meets the grant criteria. Additional federal funding is important since not all of the fund sources in our capital program are 100% secured, and there was cost escalation just from the year-long pause of capital awards during COVID. We are also watching very closely how inflation, supply chain, commodity prices, and increased competition might impact costs. The MTA's 2020 to 2024 capital program assumes nearly $10 billion in borrowing, but it's not in our interest to go to the market before we can maximize our federal sources. So we plan to aggressively pursue all relevant grant opportunities. So what specifically are we doing now? Um, one of the things we're doing uh, is we are developing an application to help fund the, our transition to a zero emission bus fleet through a beefed up grant program for low and no emission buses, which was published in the last few weeks. We carry 16% of the nation's bus riders and operate 10% of the bus fleet, but there are over 400 bus operators across the country and these funds are likely to be distributed widely. We are also finalizing three applications, two ADA stations and one substation project for a competitive program that has broad applic applicability um, that's currently open for applications. We expect to be competitive for a new discretionary program aimed at accessibility improvements in systems that predate, that were built out um, before the ADA. Regulations for this program haven't been issued yet, but we have plan, plan to apply for ADA projects that are in the capital program with an emphasis on those in equity areas. Other new competitive programs are focused on rail car replacement, resiliency, grade crossings, rail safety, congestion relief, and energy. These solicitations haven't been published yet either, but we're rolling up our sleeves to identify the best candidate projects in our capital program. These are all highly competitive categories that agencies across the country will compete for. We know our success is not a given, but we think we have a very strong case. Our projects inherently address the administration's climate and equity goals that, we are, um, that we're seeing in the grant criteria that's been released so far. We have one of the lowest greenhouse gas emissions per capita and projects that make the transit system more reliable help avoid out migration of jobs and residents to more car dependent areas that have less energy efficient land use patterns. These same reliability projects improve access to employment, educational opportunities, and daily needs for transit dependent populations, including low income and minority communities in our very diverse service area. And finally, our projects have high ridership on day one. So we're working diligently in a cross-functional manner 
um, with staff from C&D, from the CFO's office and the operating agencies to identify the best candidates and develop strong applications. The competitive grant programs and the bipartisan infrastructure law are an opportunity for us to get closer to what we view as our fair share of federal funding. I don't need to remind all of you that as a state, New York pays far more to the federal government than it receives back. But we also recognize the political elements that are embedded in the, capital, in the competitive grant process. And we're geared up to make our case and adapt our approach as we learn more about the upcoming programs. I'm happy to take any questions folks have. Thank you. Mr. Albert. Thank you, Naomi, for that. Um, I often use the, uh, the chart that you uh, mentioned about how we have 40 percent of the riders and receive 16 percent of the federal funding. Do you know of any legis or proposed legislation that would alter that and base the formula on ridership versus this ancient formula that's been around for who knows how long? So there's a lot, there, there's, several, there's several formulas, and they all include different factors. We've done a fair amount of work to see what factors could potentially be changed. It's a heavy lift yeah. um, because of all of the you know, transit agencies in the, in the country. What ended up happening in this bill was rather than changing the formulas per se, they, um, they increased the amount that went into this one program that has um, more narrow eligibility and is really focused for rail systems. So there is not current legislation um, on, on this topic. We did, you know, have many conversations with members of our delegation. When you on say the rail issue. systems, you mean rapid transit as well as commuter rail? Yes. Okay. Okay. Mr. Thank Kalee, you. I think, uh, I, can I just add one thing on formulas just to credit Naomi and the team? Remember, the first COVID relief bill used those very New York unfriendly capital formulas. And we, you know, we pointed out that New York, it was the first bill, New York was the place that was suffering most from COVID. We were having that incredibly dramatic reduction down to 10 percent or below of our normal ridership. And we got, usually formulas are kind of sacred and protected, and we got the, the Congress to rethink what formulas they used to allocate COVID relief money. And on the second bill and in the third bill, we did much better. So we did in the formula categories of COVID relief, remember this is the operating money, not the capital money, we did uh, overall north of 20 percent. And in the discretionary category, we did 35 percent. Naomi and some others pushed for there to be a discretionary category, which was truly based on which agencies had had most, the biggest hits from COVID financially. And that is why you saw last month the 700 plus million dollars additional come to us from the COVID relief bills. And that was our, our, our discretionary play. Thank you, Naomi, for leading that. Mr. Khaleesi, you had a question or comment. Thank you. Naomi, I just wanted to clarify something. You mentioned that there's possible funding for stations that were built pre-ADA. Um, and then you, and then I think you said that uh, you're going to look to make that for the 2024 capital plan. Um, I'm just, I was just a little confused on that. So if you do receive funding, is it going to the 2024 capital plan or is this in a, or other stations that aren't part of the 2024 capital plan? It, it is, it's all going towards the, prog the projects that are in the 2020 to 2024 capital program. Um, having said that, the dis there's a discretionary program there's, that's on the street now that's not specifically for ADA, but we're applying for a couple ADA stations that are you know, ready in the near term. And then there'll be this other discretionary program that we haven't seen the regs for yet. But yeah, the goal is to fund the projects that went through the prioritization process for the current capital program. Point on it, there is an opportunity to grow through some of these other discretionary categories Naomi's talking about. And that'll be beyond the 2024 capital stations. Yeah, if, okay. if, we, if we succeed. If we, if we succeed, if we succeed. Right, right. I mean, part of this, honestly, is also readiness in terms of design to move projects forward, but we're hoping that we hit the, we, we hit the, the gold mine in, in these other discretionary categories and we can actually move more quickly. Yeah, I know you've all been doing a lot of work, so um, yeah. I should be ready to go. Yep. Other questions or comments? Mr. Brown. Yeah, Naomi, is there anything in the, in the um, horizon here where the prohibition on the big systems using federal money for operating for operations will um, not snap back to the way it was before COVID, where we couldn't use 
federal operating money, but a bus system in Birmingham, Alabama can, um, is, which is a substantial source of inequity in our system as well. Um, is there anything you see that will um, continue in the present state and not take us back to the other situation? I mean, our, we're, as you know, we focus our, um, the federal money on, on our capital investments for a variety of reasons. I do not believe that there's anything that's currently in the bill that is changing the regulations that has smaller um, agencies that are eligible to use funds for operating. I know that there's also sort of a distinction in terms of what, how, do we, how do you count maintenance and different agencies around the country consider that differently. Can I just add something, uh, which is that to the extent that we're successful in getting more capital money, we may have to borrow a little bit less, which takes some pressure off the operating budget and yields some of the results, I think, that Mr. Brown is, is pointing at. But that is one of the, uh, you know, obviously we are operating within the constraints that the federal projects uh, are, are subject to right now. Other questions or comments before we go to uh, overtime? Thank you, Naomi, and thank you for all you did. Good morning. Um, next week, we will be releasing a report summarizing the MTA's use of overtime in 2021. This is a report we've issued for a couple of years now, and I'm happy to say that we have positive results to report on. Before we get started, let me set a bit of context. At the MTA, as in many companies, overtime is a key tool for effective management. Having existing employees work a few more hours when necessary, including scheduled overtime, for service delivery employees is often less expensive than hiring additional staff, training them, and having them join the payroll permanently. In storms, for example, or other short-term unpredictable events, it makes sense to pay overtime. Overtime is what helped us get through the COVID-related staff shortages and continue to maintain high levels of service throughout the pandemic. And overtime is what allows us to perform construction work on nights and weekends when we can avoid disrupting many of our passengers. In all of these cases, it is in the MTA's benefit and the public interest to use overtime. Sorry. No worries. In 2017 and 2018, some of the increase in overtime was the result of the New York City Transit Subway Action Plan, which required a surge of staff time to clean, repair, and maintain our infrastructure, some of which had fallen into a state of disrepair. Hiring and training new staff to perform this critical work would have taken months, or for some specialty trades like signals, years. So overtime for a short period made a lot of sense. But increases in overtime were happening across the board, not just at New York City Transit. And they had been increasing prior to the subway action plan. And so we felt there were likely some inefficiencies, not to mention potential safety issues from people working too many consecutive hours that we needed to address. Unfortunately, it was hard to know exactly what measures to take because we simply did not have enough data to identify and contain the issue. Then in 2019, you'll remember the IG's office uncovered the fact that a handful of employees had charged thousands of hours of overtime, that they did not work. Obviously, that kind of extreme abuse of the system is rare, but it was and is completely unacceptable. It's unacceptable because it reflects so poorly on this agency, but even more importantly, it's unacceptable because it is unfair to the remainder of our employees, the vast, vast majority of whom are honest, hardworking public servants. It's our responsibility as a public agency to make sure that, do we, that we do not tolerate the dishonest use of overtime by a few miscreants. But more generally, as a matter of organizational management and effectiveness, the MTA needs more visibility into overtime so that we can make sure we are using it strategically. In 2019, this board re recommended the hiring of an outside firm to evaluate a range of actions we could take to be smarter about overtime. The firm, Morrison and Forrester, issued a report with 15 recommendations to address their findings. MTA management immediately established a task force with six working groups across the agency to implement those recommendations. Broadly speaking, the recommendations fell into three categories. First, to establish more consistent overtime policies and procedures and hold managers accountable for their own staff's use of overtime. 
Second, standardized timekeeping with biometric clocks. Collect and use that data to monitor how much and where people are working. The data can then be used to determine when it is more cost efficient to use overtime, as opposed to hiring new staff. And finally, to better manage the use of overtime by integrating end-to-end -end our timekeeping systems with payroll. We've made huge progress on all of these fronts. In terms of policy, we've established one overall policy on the use of overtime. It's designed to strengthen attendance practices and the overtime approval process. The policy is based on three main principles. First, the use of overtime must be approved and documented by a supervisor or manager. Second, budgets for overtime pay and actual overtime charges must be monitored monthly. And finally, supervisors or managers who approve employees overtime must be provided by the agency with the necessary information to verify that employees actually work the overtime hours. In accordance with our timekeeping policy, we require all MTA employees, with very few exceptions, to swipe a physical card at the beginning and end of the day. In terms of data, we now have access to real-time overtime data, down to the individual. Here on the screen, you see the overtime dashboard that we built in 2020. It's available to managers so they can review actual to budget overtime spend. It also identifies top overtime earners to help managers focus their reviews. We have better accountability. Managers know they are responsible for their staff's use of overtime. And we have a consistent protocol to identify and review the work performed by what we call high earners. It's those folks who charge a lot of overtime. Managers need to be able to justify why that's the case. We've defined the problem, we have better protocols, and we have much better data in real time. There's one recommendation that is still in progress, which is to fully integrate digital timekeeping tools with payroll. We're working on it, but the truth is that simply integrating those two things is not enough. Timekeeping and payroll both need to be integrated with scheduling, because that's in many ways the key. It's the management of our workforce hours ahead of time, before they've spent the hours, that can have the greatest impact. Jay, will you walk us through the numbers? Thank you, Michelle. Here's the good news. The new policies and the new data have worked. After years of increases, we finally brought down overtime, 16% since 2018. Overtime went down, notwithstanding the staff shortages we've experienced the last couple of years with hundreds of employees at a time being out due to COVID. Notwithstanding the fact that our vacancy numbers were at record highs because of the hiring freeze during the pandemic, through all that, we're able to run full service on subways and buses while reducing overtime costs. This really is a success story. Another thing we look at, as Michelle mentioned, is how actual overtime compares to budget overtime. And here again, there's a success story. In 2018, the MTA exceeded its original budget by 26%. In 21, the overage was only 3%, basically the margin of error. We are budgeting more accurately and we're also better at assigning accountability for achieving the budget. Our supervisors and managers acknowledge the responsibility of overtime with their staff. And we have taken a significant bite out of the number of employees with excessive overtime hours. This chart shows the number of high earners of overtime, which has gone down significantly, over 60% since 2018. Looking at this data helps us in a few different ways. It helps us identify specific job functions or titles where we may need to increase staff. Um, our, top earners in, um, our top earners in 21, for example, included a number of supervisors um, because there, we didn't have enough supervisors during this time. This metric also helps us identify potential excessive abuse of overtime by specific individuals. Our operations management team conducts in-depth reviews of these high earners to spot fraud and abuse. And third, the most important reason to try to limit the number of employees who work excessive hours is simply employee safety. Thank you, Jay. That being said, our work is certainly not over. Overtime expenses continue to make up a significant portion of the MTA's budget, and there's no question that efforts to reduce overtime will play a major role in addressing the MTA's structural financial challenges. In 2022, we will be focusing on aggressive hiring to reduce overtime caused by vacancies, particularly in titles that have incurred staffing shortages. We are developing an agency-wide approach to improving availability, 
and we are reinstating the use of digital time clocks to accurately record time and attendance. Lastly, and this in many ways is the perennial issue, now that we have clear policies in place and now that we have access to solid data in real time, we can be more proactive with managing the use of overtime. Overall, we're on a very good path and headed in the right direction. We're happy to answer any questions. Not as much a, a question as a comment. I, I, I have, you know, so much. Overall, the presentation is fair, and uh, if we deem it as a good news story, that you know, that's fair and that's uh, appreciated as well. Um, you know, just for some clarity, right? I, I, we've shared with this board some of the issues that we've had with with the Chrono system. Uh, we have employees in our system that were paid or being paid this week for overtime that they have worked in December of 2021, last year. Um, the only thing that I would dispute in, in this presentation is this continued uh, perception that we can successfully uh, tie time and attendance to all of the crafts in our system. We, we just can't do it. The crafts in the field can't be tied to clocks for payroll purposes. We're punching in and out. Labor has, uh, has done every single thing that the MTA has asked and worked with the MTA on doing things to uh, combat any abuse in the system, which we appreciate you uh, um, kind of clarifying that it's a, such a few amount of people, which is appreciated because it never seemed to be that way back in the day, right? But it's a few people. You know, some that are serving time for it as we speak, which is kind of uh, sad to say, but true. All I'm, all, all I'm saying on behalf of myself, I can't speak for every labor organization out there, but we have to continue this journey understanding that we didn't hire anybody for the last couple of years, understandably. Now we're incred incredibly short on manpower. We're continuing to ask them to work 60, 70 hours a week. We're running consistent projects every single weekend around the clock where people don't get to go home, right? So the overtime is always going to be there. All, all I would ask respectfully is that when we move forward with how we're going to mandate our employees how to punch in and out and how to keep track of their time, we take into consideration the vulnerability to the connection to payroll. Understanding what we just went through with the system that has failed us miserably and we're gonna be working our way out of. So all in all, I don't think I said anything too bad, right? The, the, the presentation, the presentation was, was fair. Our workforce throughout this agency in, in, in every area, I'm confident I could say I speak for every labor leader, we, you call us, we work. We'll continue to do that. You tell us to work, we work. We want our paycheck at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the week. That's it. So please don't, you know, this perception of, of, of fraud and abuse, we got to lose that. We trusted our employees here for well over 160, 170 years on the railroad. We never questioned anything, right? Maybe that wasn't so smart at some times. But we can't also micromanage them and, and hold them to a standard that becomes, it, it, that'll affect productivity in the field down the road. That's all I'm saying. So I don't even know what I said anymore. But thank you for the presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. We, we, we note that, uh, uh, that the level of agita on this topic has, uh, has diminished over time, and I think that's partly, partly a credit to uh, the fact that what you heard from the team is, I think, a responsible re reflection of the, the, the real substantive work that's gone into managing this more effectively. Any other questions or comments on this or any of the presentations? Okay. Um, we're going to move to what what uh, our more routine business, but I know that Mr. that Board Member Lynn wanted to say a few words. Would help, wouldn't it? Okay, is that better? Uh, first, I want to start by expressing the support for the extraordinary work you've been doing, Jenna. Uh, I think this. Uh, 
meeting today is a demonstration uh, of a, an approach that tries to focus on centrally important issues um, and bringing data uh, to the presentations in a very rigorous way uh, that I think is, is tremendously helpful and something I've advocated for uh, several years uh, and I really am glad that uh, we're doing it. I've, I've met with the Overtime Committee and I think contributed some thoughts to, uh, um, to what they, they did and uh, very impressive. Uh, Michelle and Jay, the, uh, the presentation uh, that you made. Is, uh, likewise, a uh, very impressive, Jano, um, with the uh, presentation you made. Uh, I want to express uh, the support, uh, the, again, the, the extraordinary work of, of your helping secure the $15 billion of aid. Uh, and, and I think everyone should note the really unprecedented collaborative efforts uh, between the uh, city and state uh, in terms of what's going on. Um, has, has just changed the nature of, of what we do, and I, I, I want to uh, support that. Um, I think you also need to note have, have really attracted extraordinary talent um, to the agency, and uh, I think that uh, um, each appointment is, is, is extraordinarily impressive uh, and, uh, and really uh, should give us all optimism for, uh, for going forward. Um, and I think you've been making a terrific public case for mass transit. Um, so I think in all of these areas, uh, terrific grades uh, you know, and, 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 and terrific success. Um, I was asked to serve on the MTA board uh, by Mayor de Blasio um, almost three years ago. Uh, Two-thirds of that period has been during the COVID um, emergency period, which is sort of amazing to think about. Um, but today will be my last board meeting. Uh, and uh, in the over 34 months uh, that I've been on the MTA board, uh, I, I believe that uh, I've sought to focus on operational issues of which overtime was, was one and, and, and sought fair evasion, safety, finance, labor policy, COVID. All of those were things that I've sought to say we need to look at data, we need to look at hard data together um, and we want to analyze it. And I, I really think I have helped um, move uh, some of the thinking in that direction. I've had my disagreements with MTA leadership, uh, but I hope I've helped uh, a move towards clarifying, contributing some eluc and elucidating some of these important points. Um, but I leave with several serious concerns, uh, and many of them are, are, are things I think that, Jano, you expressed in, in your presentation. So I hope you'll forgive me if I felt uh, a couple of minutes. Um, but we were incredibly fortunate to get the $15 billion in federal funding and borrowing authority uh, that's let us survive. Uh, but alas, uh, these dollars are going to run out. Um, and I know that we keep thinking uh, fiscal year 25 or calendar year 25 is a long ways off, uh, but uh, the dollars will run out very quickly. Um, we had a severe financial imbalance pre-COVID, um, and you add to that imbalance uh, the huge impact and structural changes of the way New Yorkers are probably going to work in the future and where they're going to live, um, we need, uh, I think, a central focus that takes place um, right away. And, and you can't wait till fiscal, until calendar 22, 23, 24 um, to think about. Um, I think, as and you have said, I totally agree that we're going to need new revenues from the state, uh, the city, and federal governments. Um, and there needs to be a funding process that is uh, much different uh, than we now have. Uh, I think we're going to need to do hard thinking about the fare structure. Um, and I, I again want to compliment the initial work that you've done on, on the fare structure, um, but that that is going to uh, need to be. Clearly, fare evasion um, is something that we're going to have to focus on. I keep. Uh, uh, Andrew keeps talking about it. I keep hearing, uh, we keep seeing people walk through slam gates and uh, we have a system that's almost custom made to cheat. Uh, so many systems around the world require a second swipe, require um, some type of, of way that people can see whether or not you have, uh, uh, have really paid, or there can be uh, penalties. Um, we need to uh, uh, to, uh, to, to focus on those types of savings. And so besides the revenues needs to be a much greater focus um, on not losing three, four hundred million dollars a year just from the fare uh, evasion and the various other programs that we've got. 
Uh, I believe labor and management initiatives uh, achieving 21st century contracts are going to be critical. Um, you've got collective bargaining coming up in a year. Um, I think it's going to be important for labor and management together um, to figure out um, how they're going to go forward in a brand new 21st century way. Um, I can't, as you know, not talk about COVID uh, in any presentation. We've had a fortunate respite, um, but Omicron BA2 is already upon us. Who knows what's next? I think it's crazy for us to be spending millions on testing while we continue to mourn MTA workers who have recently died of COVID uh, very possibly uh, unnecessarily had they been vaccinated. Um, while the vaccination rates for some groups at the MTA um, seems to me when you look at the numbers and I've asked for specifics, never got exactly the numbers I asked for, but it seems to me that when you look at the rates of some of our workforce groups, uh, they are no better than the adult populations in Nebraska, Texas, Nevada, and Kansas. Um, and that, that we should be doing better uh, than that. Um, safety and the public's uh, perception of safety is critical to ridership. And we now have so many wonderful programs uh, with the MTA, with the NYPD, the MTA police, civilians, task forces, state and uh, city, state and homeless uh, outreach, uh, mental health programs, private contractors, cameras, data collection, um, and other technology. Uh, and I am really impressed by the transit uh, chief Jason Wilcox um, and his work. But I do, I'll say again, there needs to be a central coordinator of all these programs. Um, I really advocate a, uh, uh, a safety czar uh, to be looking at this and making sure that the state and the city and all of the various operator, operators in each of those areas um, and the MTA are working together. So the MTA has much to do, and I wish Mayor Adams the best as he makes his new appointments. Uh, I want to thank you for all listening to me over the, uh, uh, over the years, answering my numerous questions, uh, occasionally following a few of my recommendations. Um, nothing is more than New York City mass, mass transit, uh, and it is absolutely essential that you succeed. Thank you. Bob, I, I just have to say, I, it, there are many, you, you've said a lot, and we just have to say that some of the things that you brought to this board are examples to all of us, your level of engagement, your preparation, and your passion for data and for real substantive debate are things that I think all of us value, and you will, you leave a legacy because you made us all more sensitive to the fact that the board uh, activities for all of us have to reflect on those values. So thank you. Uh, do our more routine business, and unless they're okay, um, and I'll start with the um, the always interesting approval of the minutes. Um, the minutes of the February board meeting and the minutes from each of the committee have been distributed to all members. Have they not? Are there any corrections or omissions? Just one correction. Okay. On page five, uh, Christopher Greif's name is spelled incorrectly. It's spelled as grief. It should yeah. be E-I-F, not I-E-F. Thank you. And his, his name was mispronounced at one point, so we're going to try to get it right on all counts in the future. Thank you for the point. Any other, anything else? Um, if there are no further corrections, the minutes are approved as distributed and correct, uh, as corrected, actually. Okay. There are no action items or procurements for bridges and tunnels, joint railroad, and New York City transit committees. This is reflecting the consolidation of uh, procurements into the um, CPC committee, the Capital Program Committee, where, where most of those procurements actually take place. Um, uh, if there's no further report from the chairs of these committees, board members Mack, Herman and Mahaltzis will move to capital program. Anything further? Okay. All right. Moving on. Uh, Mr. Zuckerman, the capital program committee vice chair, will you report to the board? Yes, sir. Thank you for the delegation. Uh, the capital program committee met on Monday and reports the following. There are 15 actions this month, 14 competitive procurements and one ratification for a total of $242 million. This committee recommends these items and I move them. May I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition or abstention? The items carry. 
Mr. Zuckerman, will you deliver the Finance Committee report? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. The Finance Committee met on Monday and reports the following. There are two action items this month. The first item seeks board approval to authorize the execution, filing, and acceptance of federal funds. Thank you. Uh, the second action seeks board approval for the 2021 All Agency Procurement Report. The committee recommends these actions, and I move them. Do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Any opposition or abstention? The items carry. Mr. There, Zuckerman. Thank you. There is one competitive procurement for a total amount of $11.5 million. The Finance Committee recommends this procurement, and I move it. Second. All in favor? Opposition or abstention? The item carries. Thank you. There are three real estate action items for this month described on pages 52 to 55 of the board book. The committee recommends these items, and I move them. Second. Second. All in favor? Any contrary-minded abstention? <laughs> the real estate item carries. Okay. Deal again. Uh, this concludes the Finance Committee report. Thank you, sir. Okay. I chaired the Corporate Governance Committee on Monday and report the following. There are three action items this month to approve the MTA procurement guidelines, the 2021 mission statement, and certain policies pursuant to public authorities law. The committee recommends these items, and I move them. Is there a second? Thank you, Jamie. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition or abstention? Thank you. The items carry. We have one final topic to discuss today. May I have a motion to convene an executive session to discuss matters which will imperil public safety if disclosed pursuant to Section 105.1e of the New York State Public Officer Law? So moved. Second. All Second. in favor? Any opposition? We're going back in. We're going to public se uh, executive session.
record. Um, while in executive session, the board discussed security matters. The session was informational and no action uh, is required by the board. May I now have a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
audio here. <laughs> That's why I always come up first. Uh, we're all ready to go. Happy, relaxed. You're, you're pointing at Michael because you don't want to ask a question today? Okay, so Michael goes first, then you, then, Cl then Clayton. Can we put Clayton in somewhere? All right. All right, very well. <laughs> you, you were yawning, though. We, we snoozed you out from the board meeting? How is that possible? Really? I mean, Jano's going to be disappointed. He shows up and you're yawning. Are we are we charging for the sodas? We're we're facing like two billion in the out years. We got to get it somewhere, Clayton. I mean, come on. All right. Very well. Uh, we're ready to go here. Stand by. Is uh, is Mr. Lieber? Here we go, Jan Lieber, everybody. Come on up. Come on up. I want all these fabulous people to come up. If you're not, if you don't have blue behind you, you're not in the picture. Okay. Okay, we covered a lot of ground at the board meeting today. Um, and there's a lot of excitement about one new member of our team, Rich Davies. Um, but I just didn't want, it's Women's History Month, and I did not want it to go uh, unmentioned that um, the core of our leadership team at the MTA today uh, is fabulous, talented women who have joined us or taken on new roles. And I, I, I just need to celebrate that. Last night I was at the Women's Transportation Seminar annual dinner, and um, we had a chance to celebrate them. and. Um, because so few of you were at the Women's Transportation <laughs> Seminar dinner. I'm doing it again today. Kathy Rinaldi, the, the uh, incredibly uh, experienced MTA hand who's been running Metro North, became also the president, the interim president of the Long Island Railroad. Lizette Camillo came to us as from where she was commissioner of the city's department, uh, the DCAS of the city of New York, to be our chief administrative officer. Paige Graves, where are you, Paige? Paige Graves, you all see her sitting next to me and kicking me under the table during the board meeting, so that's because she's the general counsel of the MTA after a storied career in both in, in private sector law and in, in government law as well. Uh, Shanifa Riera came to us from the New York City Controller's Office where she was the deputy controller and has done amazing things in broadening our outreach footprint and what communities uh, I'm able to talk to and the MTA is able to work with. Um, L Laura Wiles, standing there, is uh, the chief of staff of the MTA, uh, an MTA uh, person from long standing, but really stepping up to help me um, create hopefully a functional uh, MTA organization. Um, you heard today from Naomi Rennick, who's the new director of federal affairs. Naomi and um, she's incredible uh, MTA, uh, MTA talent. Um, you also heard from Michelle Woods, who's our auditor general. And you heard as well from Jay Patel, who's the deputy CFO. Juliet Michelson, who's um, wandering the halls cleaning up messes I made at the board meeting somewhere. <laughs> Is, um, is the deputy head of external affairs. And not, not here today, uh, Sarah Meyer, uh, who was the head of customer, no, Sarah Meyer, who was the head of customer, I knew she was there, can't miss her. The head of customer relations at, at Transit um, is a direct report to me. And we, had, we, we reorganized the reporting structure of the chairman's office to reduce the number of direct reports, but I made Sarah direct report because she heads customers. It was kind of a big priority for me. And also a, direct, a new direct report is Anita Miller, who heads labor relations, two of the mo what I think of as the most important issues. Um, one uh, extra person not here is Jessica Matthews, who came to us from the city's Department of Design and Construction, where she was an assistant commissioner. Uh, and on and on and on. Um, 
This is the, the, the core of our team. So while we're going to celebrate um, Rich Davey and we're going to celebrate even having a, a CFO who comes to us after a storied career at Goldman Sachs, the, the centerpiece of our, of our new team at the MTA is incredibly talented women. So I wanted to acknowledge you on Women's History Month before it ends, almost. Thank you all. Okay, um, so uh, we, you know, a lot of conversation in public at the board meeting about issues of, of safety. And I, I'm just going to repeat what I said before, earlier today, which is that we are acutely sensitive to the fact that the customers are telling us that they, they don't uh, feel safe on the system, that a lot of our customers, not everyone, but a lot of our customers are letting us know that that is something that is very much on their minds. We do surveys, um, and, and that is the message. Fortunately, we, have, we are seeing significant changes um, from our partners in the city and partnership development between the NYPD and City Hall and the social service agencies and the MTA that's starting to make a difference. And I just want to repeat what I said at the board meeting, which is, for example, the change from of bringing cops onto trains and onto the platforms where riders are feeling vulnerable is already starting to yield results. For weeks I've been seeing, you know, since this started happening, people have the, something bad happens on the train, they arrive at a station, there's a cop on the platform, the cops have to intervene and apprehend somebody or at least stop that thing from happening. L just last night, two major incidents that in illustrate the impact of this new deployment and new approach, which is that the cops who are coming, the, the NYPD officers who are coming in from topside, that is to say the precinct officers who have been instructed to include subway stations in their patrols. This was not happening before. Last night, somebody did that in Jackson Heights. He came down onto the platform, found somebody who was, you know, who was spread out on the platform, apparently intoxicated, lo and behold, uh, when he awoke uh, that fellow, uh, the, uh, a loaded 22 fell out of the guy's jacket. And similarly, there was a situation where there was a cop on the train last night and somebody moved between cars, which you know is prohibited for safety reasons. The cops went after him and they also found a loaded gun. In a city where we're talking about the need to address the problem of guns, um, these are really, really important illustrations of the new approach to safety and security that Mayor Adams has brought and the commitment that the governor and the mayor together have made to help uh, people who have mental health issues get into services, get into treatment, get out of the system is starting to take effect as well. So I am optimistic, a long way to go, but this is a huge issue and I just want to be on record again as thanking the PD and the City Hall and Albany for what they have done. With that. All right, continuing the theme, Women's History Month, we go right to Michelle Kasky from Bloomberg News. Michelle, good afternoon. Wow, I didn't know I was going to be first. <laughs> um, hi, Jano. So uh, I wanted to ask you about, it seems like there's two things going on here. You've got, as you said, you're looking at a $2 billion dollar barrel that's staring at you of this um, this deficit that you guys are going to face, but at this end, so you've talked endlessly about how you're going to need to create, work with Albany to create new revenue funding, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you, it, the MTA is at risk of losing some funding um, even before that with, uh, if there's a gas tax suspension. So, you know, it, it just seems like there's two things going on here where, you know, you, you need more money and at the same time, it looks like you're going to get less money. Um, even before the deficit hits. So I don't know what your information, but here's mine, which mm -hmm. is that all of the ideas about the gas tax holiday or some action on the gas tax have as one of their principal provisions the dollar-for-dollar dollar replacement of any lost revenue to the MTA. So that's been important. That's what we've been assured by the players in Albany who are working on the budget. That's what we're counting on uh, 100 percent. So. I, I don't think, based on what I'm being told, uh, that the, uh, 
the issue that you're raising, Michelle, is a net negative, should be a net negative to the MTA's bottom line. And do you still anticipate roughly that would be around 400 million? You used that good, figure. Good, good question. Yeah. From if that was the right estimate of the benefit that we get from the gas tax, from uh -huh. what I'm told, um, but. Right now, I understand that the versions of this idea that are floating around in the budget table in Albany are actually, the impact is like 100 million. But again, the concept is dollar for dollar replacement of that money from the state rev general fund, and we're counting on that. Roughly about 100 million that, this year, this calendar year. Yes, that's, that's what we understand to be the value of the approach that is legislatively being negotiated in, in, in uh, the legislature with the executive as well. And is that the petroleum business tax? Or is it, yeah, Ke you know what? this you're, is more of a question for Kevin. You're, you're gonna force me to call the guy with gray hair for it. Okay, <laughs> here we go. You say bonds, I say willens. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks. The, uh, what, what's being considered is the motor fuel tax. There was an earlier proposal that would include the petroleum business tax. But again, based on the version we understand, it would be the uh, motor fuel tax, not the petroleum business tax. And then a little piece from sales tax that we get on, on motor fuels. I think, you know, one point before the, the, the uh, question is asked that in addition to the hold harmless provision that would make sure the MTA gets the same amount of funds this year, there's the mechanics are such that the same amount of funds, those replacement funds, would flow through the accounts and be pledged to bondholders. So the dedicated tax bondholders are also not harmed in terms of the amount of revenue that is directly pledged to them. And I'll uh, also want to remind you that the MTA always reserves the right to pay bondholders from other funds we have. So again, I, we don't have any concerns at this moment based on the, the version that, that bondholder payments are, are, are at all at risk. Okay, thank you. I think we've beaten that one to death. Let's go. Could be one of the best voices in transit, by the way, right there. Kevin Willens just observing. Uh, Anna would be next, but she is yielding her question to her colleague Michael Gold wow. of the New York Times. Michael, good afternoon. Just want to prove that we're two different people and that sometimes we're <laughs> in the same place. Um, since Michelle asked my gas tax question, I will shift to safety. Uh, we, we just got the first month of data from City Hall on this. I, I'm sure you've seen it. It's thousands of summons, most of them for fare evasion. And uh, the quality of life concerns are something like 20% of the summons they've issued. At the same time, outreach teams have put maybe 10 people a day in a shelter. They're talking to 650 people a day. Um, so we have a better sense of how their efforts are working. But I know that, that you all have been very concerned, as you've said, with rider complaints and with the customer experience. And I guess I'm curious, from, from that angle, how you would evaluate what you're hearing from people and what you think the next priority should be as we move into you know month two and three of this plan. Look. Uh, uh I think, number one, there's no question that riders continue to express concerns over quality of life issues and the sense of safety in the system. They're also recognizing the visibility of the police force, the NYPD, and the redeployment that the mayor has set in motion. So they're acknowledging, hey, I'm glad to see the cop on the platform. I'm glad to see cops on the train. That makes me feel safer. So. Um, there's no, we, we definitely have a ways to go in terms of rider perception. There are also, part of the story is some super high profile incidents that have reinforced some of the concerns that people, you know, have, and even if they haven't experienced it directly. So um, I, I'd, I'd say, we, you know, we're making progress, but we definitely have a ways to go. The mayor's commitment and the governor's commitment does, uh, I think, give everybody uh, significant you know, it's starting to catch uh, a wave of optimism, but, but we're, we've, we definitely have a ways to go. Our view, and we've shared it with the city, and we're working very much hand in glove, is that the most effective uh, area to focus on is these end of line stations, in part because that gives you, an, uh, frankly, a, a, the, the most uh, calm and organized environment in which to try to have that interaction where you're, you're offering services and and trying to get somebody who, for whatever reason, is sheltering on the system or, or riding around um, to, 
to be open to that offer and to have a meaningful interaction. Uh, so that's that has been, you know, our point of view. The city is definitely um, increasing its focus on end of line stations, and we welcome that. Separately, I wonder if you all have any sense. Um, the city data doesn't have this, but obviously you have workers in the system every day. Of uh, I know that they've put 310 people into shelter or safe haven beds, but I wonder if you have any sense if those people are returning to the system? I, I, I don't, and you know, listen, this is gonna, we have to be honest with New Yorkers and everybody, this is gonna take a while, um, but you're, you're, you know, it's, it's definitely a percentage game. There will be some folks who, who God willing, um, get out of the, the, the situation they're in in a permanent way, and, and you know, being realistic, there will be others that don't. It's just too early to say um, what those percentages are and whether we're collectively making a dent in the situation. And joining us on Zoom, we've got Danielle Dunn of Politico. Danielle, you're up. Hi, Danielle. Hi. Hi, Jano. Um, I have two questions today. My first is, um, given that pen access and pen reconstruction may be eligible for 80% federal funding, as mentioned during today's presentation. Why does the MTA feel it's still necessary to move forward with the current Vernado plan to fund Penn Station upgrades through a rezoning, um, particularly given the uncertainty surrounding the return to work? Well, first of all, the, the MTA's not, you know, the idea that the MTA is, is involved with what you call the Vernado plan is just not accurate. We're, we're running the transportation uh, piece of this broader vision, and the ESDC in the state are running the land use. But what I would say to you is there are significant benefits to the transportation side of the equation from the land use, the vision of, of uh, you know, a, 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 an improved land use or a different land use situation around Penn Station. One is every one of those sites that's being talked about include new entrances to Penn. And if you know Penn Station, if you use Penn Station, it's the opposite of Grand Central. Grand Central is good in, one of the reasons we like Grand Central is so porous. You can move north, south, east, west in all these different entrances. Penn has very little of that. So having additional entrances is really important. The other reason, the other benefit from a transportation standpoint of what's being talked about is you know, all these underground concourses for pedestrians. Because if you spend time on 7th Avenue in the rush, even now during COVID, you feel this incredible pedestrian gridlock. Um, we need to be able to, for people to move in and out Penn Station, especially when ridership continues to grow over time with more trains coming through more tunnels. Uh, and so we, there are huge transportation benefits for the, the land use ideas that are being uh, offered up by the state and by the ESDC. So that's what we're saying. As far as the funding piece of this goes, you know, it's right now there is uh, there's no uh, there's no program that's been written. Um, obviously, people talk in theory about 80 percent uh, eligibility, but those programs that our folks are talking about, you know, part, what are you part of what you heard today is we're planning to pursue everything, but the regulations have been, haven't been written. The uh, uh, the there's no uh, uh, there are no there's no timeline for when those uh, applications are going to be open, and we're trying to move forward as quickly as possible. The ultimate vision includes, and, and the other variable is the ultimate vision includes not only existing Penn Station, which the governor said she wants done as soon as possible after Eastside Access opens at the end of this year. So we need money now. Um, in addition to that. Um, obviously, part of what is going to be done is the uh, is the, the the gateway expansion and all of that. Where you know, at some point, you're going to need tracks and platforms to accept the new tunnels that everybody is already supportive of and that are happening. So, there are there are a lot of reasons why the broader vision um, of you know an expanded or improved uh, Midtown West neighborhood actually benefits the transportation side of the equation. Putting on my old hat as a, uh, uh, as a crappy real estate developer, um, I, I would just say to you, you know, and really think about the policy implications, right? What 
could be more important than putting the best the jobs next to mass transit from a climate change standpoint. That's what we did at the World Trade Center, right? Yeah. Put jobs right next to mass transit. You need that for climate change. You need it for post-congestion pricing. That's a real policy advantage. And the other variable that people don't talk about enough is the value capture idea, which is when we start to improve Penn Station and expand Penn Station, the value is going to grow in the neighborhood. And good policy, and this is you know something that people have talked about for a long time, says that you ought to capture some of that value for the public and for the building of the infrastructure through bonds, rather than just letting it go to whoever happens to open uh, own adjacent real estate. So value capture, climate change policy, planning for the city's future, all those reasons are good reasons to have a plan for a modernized district around existing Penn, but I'm just in charge of the transportation. Thanks, Jana. That was very thorough. I appreciate that. Um, I do my best. My next, <laughs> my next question is um, a different topic. Did you get a second um, question after that one? Minted, come on. <laughs> He didn't dive in. It's fast Women's enough. History Month, sir. You know what? Right. <laughs> now this right. one's um, Cologne, should be faster. I, I was just curious. Um, how many encampments um, has the MTA cleared this year as part of the sweep? Does that differ from prior years? Just any yeah. information you can give on? Uh, listen, that? I mean, the, the, the part of this is terminology. Um, Encampment sometimes is used to describe everything, like an encampment that the police department's definition of encampment, which is the one that we're trying to get our teams to use, is where somebody sets up a structure, right? And sets up a, something. If they're just lying out on the platform, it's not an encampment. We call that public obstruction. So we're, we're doing, every couple weeks, we, we, we do a, a, a sweep, and we try to get, um, try to get more uh, consistent and thorough data on this. I think it's premature to tell you there's a, a, a week by week um, uh, number, you know, that we, we can track it exactly. But I'll tell you this, the police department is intensely focused on making sure that, you know, the word encampments is, you know, suggestive of like a little village or something. That's not mostly what's happening in the subway system. And it gets confused with like people just lying out on the mezzanine, for example, and you know, we have a lot of that in the West Fourth Station, which we're, we're dealing with, versus uh, situations which are actually um, trespassing, where someone gets into a room that's off limits, or God forbid, even gets into a room in the tunnels or something like that. So they're all different, but we're trying to track them all a little bit better. And our, our, our strong impression, without giving you specific numbers, is that, the, uh, is that the NYPD is really focused on that and really trying to, to uh, uh, address that problem thoroughly. All right, sir, we move on to uh, someone who reliably comes with a single question each month, one and done, Clayton Gusa of the New York Daily News. I have, uh, I have three. <laughs> um, each one may be more irritating for you than the previous. You, yeah, I know. Um, you so, outdo yourself, sir. Well, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> it's an easy one. Uh, your board approved a $50 million contract with TAP Electrical for yeah. CCTV cameras at 88 stations. Um, how are those different from the other cameras at every subway station that you guys had ruled out last year? What are you looking to get out of these new kind of eyes in the sky? Okay, can, can, if, if I can just give you, subject to clarification, I'll, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll tell you what I'm pretty sure. Those are cameras that are connected to, you know, the CCTV system is connected to, uh, we have the ability to do the, the connection so that they can be monitored contemporaneously. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get back to you with more specifics, Clayton. Well, we, you know, part of what we rushed to do, uh, and this was before I came in, um, was to make sure we literally had cameras in every sa station, and some of them can be monitored you know, at the same time, and uh, some of them cannot, where you're capturing visual data, and then if something bad happens, you go back and try to get a picture of the person who did it. That has helped us to, like, literally the PD has been able to arrest again and again a wrongdoer based on the photographic evidence, the film evidence that's captured on those cameras, but I think the TAP Electric contract has contemporaneous monitoring capacities, and that's one thing that we're trying to do more of. Okay. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. absolutely. I wanted to ask about staffing. Uh, your service delivery numbers show that 
uh, staffing's actually plateaued in some of those key jobs in the subway. Uh, you're down, I think, 25 jobs in that realm from November to February, and you're still more than 400 short of where you were in March of 2020. So when do you expect, do you expect to get up to pre-pandemic levels when it comes to subway service delivery staffing? When does that happen and, are, and why are you having trouble kind of growing? It seems like you've hit a, you've hit a plateau here in, in bringing people on and beating well, let me, out attrition. Let me, let me ask the experts to comment on that one, Craig. So one thing, Clayton, as you've seen, I mean, service delivery numbers have continued to improve, you know, absence, the effect of Omicron month over month. You know, when we took this challenge on, you know, uh, Jano and I uh, back in August, we knew that we had uh, hundreds of vacancies, and we knew that we not only had to, uh, you know, onboard uh, train operators and conductors um, quicker, but also make the best use of our resources. Yeah. By the end of the second quarter, so let me get back. So originally, train operators took between seven and eight months to train. We took a look at that uh, curriculum, and without affecting safety, we were able to dial that back. Now they... Uh, Get, get, get trained between six and seven months. So with the effect of attrition and those uh, that we hired back six or seven months ago, by the end of the second quarter, we anticipate being back to pre-pandemic vacancy level. So what you'll see is April, May, and June, we have many classes that'll be uh, graduating, be in the cabs. But again, it's not about only um, you know, bringing people on board but maximizing our use of our resources. And, you know, we're proud to say that we continue to uptick month over month of service delivery numbers, as you see in the book. Okay. And then real quick, last one. Um, I wanted to ask about the $100 million you budgeted this year to test unvaccinated uh, transit workers weekly. Um, you would plan to get that money reimbursed from FEMA, but given what's going on at the federal level with those COVID dollars running out, do you still anticipate that that money is going to be reimbursed? Yeah, we're we're we're. we're fully expecting the money to be reimbursed and we are, you know, there is, they have continuously uh, um, pushed out the date when eligibility for COVID related health expenses like that kind would be eligible. So we fully expect those to be reimbursed. All right, moving on Zoom, we've got Steve Nesson is standing by from WNYC and Gothamist. Steve, good afternoon. Hello. Hello, Jano. Thanks Hi, again. Uh, just to follow up on the stroller policy, what exactly is the committee announced this week looking at? And I should add, or I want to add, the MTA isn't the first transit agency to deal with this, including your new transit president, who said in the past banning strollers at MBTA was, uh, sorry, was the dumbest idea he ever floated. Uh, you've heard feelings are strong on both sides, so how will you also balance this and 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 get it done? Well, I, I, I am not the one who's going to lead those conversations, um, but I, I just want to say I, 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 a shout out to Craig and to Quimel Arroyo, who did very quickly once they saw this issue developing, which created some tension between the disability community and the, the folks who are advocating for a different stroller policy, to, to pull together uh, this idea of a working group where that dialogue can take place. And I, I, I'm going to ask Craig to comment further. Yeah, uh, you know, like Jano had mentioned, so we had taken a look at this uh, policy that had been longstanding on the buses uh, pre-pandemic, you know, because we had um, heard from our customers, specifically mothers with strollers, that, you know, they wanted more ex uh, access to our buses. Uh, you know, COVID hit. Uh, well, let me start off by saying when we took a look at it, we recognized that there was a number of um, of, uh, of customer bases that use our buses, and you heard from them today, uh, customers with disabilities, elderly. Uh, also, we recognized that there was some safety implications around having open strollers on our buses. You know, uh, unlike when there's a wheelchair that is strapped down, strollers, there's no place in the bus for a stroller to be strapped down. So we had some concerns around the risk involving short stops and the like. Uh, I mean, long story short, you know, pandemic, uh, we got getting past the pandemic and we heard from our customers at the two committees ago um, about their their uh, their ask about using strollers on our buses. We went back. We started to have some conversations. But again, you know, it's about conversations, not only for that customer base, but the broader customer base. So Cumel Arroyo, myself, Frank Anacaro, uh, we recognized that there was some differing of opinion, some concern. Uh, so actually it was Cumel who said, let's put together a, um, a task force of bringing bus operators, disability advocates, mothers together 
figure out how we could uh, come up with a policy that sort of serves uh, the full customer base. And, you know, that's where the discussions are headed now. All right, let's uh, move on to Dave Colon right there. Um, different uh, blue and orange today. Good afternoon, Dave. Yeah, it's baseball season. Go Mets. Um, I got two for you today, Jano. Uh, one is, I know you were talking before that um, you were talking with uh, Wonks up in Albany and you guys are making your case for new revenue streams um, and uh, you know doing what you can to try to find new money. Uh, so far this year, it doesn't really seem like legislators are very receptive to the idea since what we have so far is a guest tax holiday that'll blow a hole in uh, uh, some budget somewhere. So I'm just curious if you think that the legislature is going to be taking this seriously uh, at any time before uh, you know we start hitting this cliff. I, in, in fairness, I, I never expected that this would be addressed in the current uh, legislative session. Uh, so. You know, you can put that on if you really think that's a proof of failure. You can put that on on I mean, me. It's not a failure. No, I mean, but I, I don't think it's indicative of the level of interest. You know, we've talked to legislators about. You know, it it, it is only recently that uh, the the level of federal aid that's coming to us for COVID has settled down. We need to update our financial projections based on actual experience with the epidemic, the pandemic, and the ridership implications, and. You know, thanks to the governor, we're um, we're we're not just good uh, through you know the middle of 25. We're actually good through the end of 25 because of of the contribution that the executive budget made uh, to to uh, the MTA's operating budget. So, um, and by the way, that's a gift that keeps on giving because those increased levels of aid that the governor's executive budget laid out had were out for the out years as well. So. Um, so it's a, it's a 2026 issue. Um, we've used the time this year as the, the state is kind of coming, you know, trying to settle out its new budget post-COVID to educate people about where we are. I think we've done a reasonably good job of raising the issue. And we need there to be time for the legislature and, the, as I say, the policy community to look at different options. And that's going to happen, you know, in the course of this year. Um, and the other thing, I wanted to go back to something that we were talking about yesterday at the uh, bus redesign press conference. Um, I had asked about older bus boarding and you and the pilot, and you had said, the question of when do we inaugurate it or pilot it is an open question that we have to wrestle with right now uh, because we don't have a full range of payment options on the bus. Uh, but there was supposed to be a pilot. It was announced last year. It's been stuck in neutral. Are you guys backing away from this pilot? Can you give us a date when the pilot's going to start, what it's going to uh, involve? Because it seems like this is something that's just kind of flailing right well, now. Here, here's what I would say on this subject. Number one, we're committed to all door boarding. Number two is um, we, we need to, doing a pilot when you don't really have, you know, the percentage of bus riders who are using Omni is I think under 20% right now. So if you have a rear door boarding system that you don't, that is just limited to people who have adapted to Omni, that's not really fair. So we need to have, um, when by the time that we actually start rear door boarding and have a meaningful pilot, we need to have, uh, you know, the, the more adaptation of Omni by bus riders, and I think we need to have you know, a neutral situation where everybody gets to use the back of the bus if they, and pay through the back of the bus. Um, so that's why I don't think, and I said this to you honestly, I've talked to a couple of the advocacy groups, that I think that, that rushing into a rear door boarding pilot at this moment is, may not be fair or responsible because a lot of people are, wouldn't be eligible to go in the back of the bus because they're not Omni users. What we really need to do, is, the whole point is to figure out can you, take away the, you know, reduce the dwell time that's associated with having only front door boarding, I don't think that that could be accomplished in a world where, say, only 10 percent of the riders could use the back door. So that's why I am honestly rethinking the timing of the, of the rear door boarding pilot, which was meant to be a pilot. So that pilot that was announced last August and you guys are studying 10 routes that are going to be on it, that's that's, in, that's not happening. It, it, I, I, like I said, I'm trying to rethink when would be the right time to do it. I wouldn't say it's not happening. I think we need to think about how do we get there and do it in a real way that makes it possible for everybody to use the back door because you know, their fair payment options will be available there. And since you invoked the term 
in fairness in your response. Policy requires we go immediately to Jose Martinez of the city. Jose, you're up. Poor, I, I guess say Mr. Dunn has been politely waiting for his chance in the front row, but uh, go, go ahead. The policy uh, is the policy. Okay, the policy is the policy. Okay. Thank you, uh, J uh, Tim. I was disappointed I didn't get a let's go out west to Jose <laughs> in the way that you do for Alfonso. Uh, Jeno, um, following up a little bit on what Clayton asked about service delivery and staffing, uh, I wanted to swing it into the direction of capital projects. Uh, there are several listed in the uh, MTA documents this month where staffing has uh, affected the completion and delayed some projects. So could you please address how staffing is looking on uh, some capital projects, uh, specifically on the track, uh, track replacement projects? Um, thank you. You know, I don't want to disappoint you, but I, 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 before I respond, I need to, that's one that I just don't know the specifics on, so I'll have to get back to you on that. I mean, I think it's, it's, I it's it, we have, you know, just, I think if you're talking about track is generally in-house work, right? Um, so, you know, if there's, if there are staff shortages, you can't get as much work done. Um, the principal impact on capital projects from staffing has been on the Amtrak projects, the projects where we're, we're doing in Harold Interlocking and Amtrak territory, where they're, they've had these chronic problems with electric traction power linemen and track workers, I mean, track foremen and flaggers. And it's no secret that the East Side Access Project is, you know, part of its, you know, its uh, legendary cost uh, problems has been attributed to the fact that you can't, haven't been able to get the work done because Amtrak hasn't been able to support the work or they haven't been able to do the work themselves. That's the one I really know about. I don't know the issue you're talking about. All right, but it was a fair question. Kevin Duggan, AM New York. Kevin. All right, thanks for taking my question. Um, yeah, I wanted to start quickly first on the um, the fair cap. You talked about the numbers that look pretty promising. Uh, are you, would you like to see it continue past the four-month pilot or maybe add something like a monthly fair cap uh, to the program? Where do you stand on that right now, looking at the numbers? Um, we have to comply with the rules about... Um, about you know what we call fair pilots and so on, so we have to look at the data before we make any decisions to extend the pilot, or to go through the um, somewhat uh, you know complicated MTA permanent fair adjustment process. So I don't want to prejudge it, but the the, the take up is so good that it it's got a way in favor of making this permanent. Okay, um, I think, uh, I don't know if Craig's still here. Oh, yes. I have a question about that stroller thing. I wanted to follow up as well because this was a big topic today among public speakers. Um, you know, what's the timeline for this working group? When do you anticipate coming back with some sort of framework? Is it before you're heading over to become COO or is it after that, let's say? It's a month. So, I mean, we haven't set a timeline with the working group. What I would say is that, you know, Rich, who's coming on May 2nd, uh, you know, I'm sure he'll be part of those conversations as well. Again, I think it's all about listening to the different uh, constituencies and coming up with a policy that, you know, serves, serves them all. It's not what we heard from our customers, uh, specifically the moms. It's not about us or them. It's about, you know, how we could all come together to serve, uh, our, you know, customers with disabilities, the elderly, and, you know, the moms with strollers. All right, so let's move on to David Meyer of the New York Post right there. David. Thank you so much. Um, two questions. First, um, on Monday, Kevin mentioned that um, – Kevin Willens, okay. Wylands, um, uh mentioned that there would be a new ridership study being conducted. Uh, is that going to be done by McKinsey, um, and how will it defer, differ from the previous one? Well, but I think it, it, it has to be procured competitively, so I don't – know where we are in that procurement, but the goal is to have the new analysis. Remember, you know, I, I, this is not just coming up with stuff out of thin air. You're looking at patterns, based, the original McKinsey study looked at the patterns of the, the trajectory of pandemics based on history as well as this one, also trajectory of economic recovery and developing models that reflect that. So that, but 
even though it's, it's pretty complicated, that work has to be done in time for us to factor it into the July plan, the update of our budget. So that's the schedule, and I, we are in procurement. I don't know whether we finalize that, but we're pretty close, and we're going to get started promptly. Understood. And my other question is on, uh, we reported earlier this week that um, under a 2020 statute allowing uh, certain uh, people convicted of crimes uh, to be banned from transit, none have been banned, zero. I'm wondering a couple of things, if that concerns you. I know you've called for more power to ban um, recidivist criminals. I'm wondering if that uh, raises concerns about the concept in general for you, um, and whether you've had any conversations with judges or district attorneys about actually enacting and enforcing this rule. Listen, you know, I have a lot of stuff that I am responsible for. Uh, the criminal justice system is not one of those areas. But all I can do in this area is express the gut feeling of the riders, which is if somebody is has a pattern of of doing stuff that's criminal or cruel or taking advantage of people or victimizing them in our system, it doesn't make sense to us that they should be able to walk right back into the system and do it again and again. I don't really have a, a legislative proposal or a, some kind of criminal justice proposal. I rely on the professionals to do that, but I'm going to keep speaking out for riders that you know when there are people who have done things that victimize people again and again in the system, especially you know these, some of these cruel episodes that seem so outrageous, we ought to find a way to say the privilege of using the public space that we all share, which is so sacred because it's what makes New York possible, you can't do it, you can't use that public space if you're going to victimize people again and again. I'm comfortable with that as a broad principle. I'd rely on others to figure out how to effectuate it. And taking us out today is Miss Anna Lay of the New York Times. Anna. Thank you. Hey, Jano. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, your organizational structure. So you've made some pretty high-profile changes in leadership, and yeah. um, I'd, I'd love to see uh, the, the like an org chart of uh, not just MTA HQ, but you know New York City Transit. Uh, you know, uh, the, the railroads, uh, is that something that your team is working on? You know, could we just take a look at you no, know, how I'm, this I'm massive structure is laid certain out? I'm certain I can give you the, the MTA HQ one. Um, we'll, we'll get back to you on, uh, on, on the other pieces. I mean, some of them are a little bit work in progress because we've had changes in leadership, but um, it's a fair question. It's open, you know, it should be open information if, if it isn't already. And we're happy to give it back to you, and we'll share it with everybody. Yeah, that'd be great. I haven't been able to find it. Um, and, you know, there like you I said, there's changes, so it'd be nice to get something Fair enough. Date. Fair enough. Thank you. All right, folks, that is that. Good. Thanks to Thank uh, you, Craig everybody. and uh, the rest, Jano. Thank you. And good afternoon from Lower Manhattan.